So uh, as I mentioned, that, uh, Singapore is actually uh, pretty depressed now. So we have about uh, 1,000 new cases almost every day for the past few days. And uh, the entire country is locked down. There's echo. It's okay, okay. now. Okay. Uh, and uh, to such a degree that anybody who goes out, even let's say your husband and wife, you cannot go out together. It cannot be more than one person at a time. So uh, it's so strict now. <laughs> I think it's a, it's a huge challenge to the research community and to the uh, uh, higher education community. So I wonder, John, how, how do you cope with that? Uh, or how does the Northwestern cope with this situation? Well, I'm not sure that we have any unique strategies uh, in a sense. We're probably approaching it in a way that's pretty similar to, to lots of other folks in, in similar positions. But I went to a mode of uh, bi-weekly group meetings by, by Zoom just to keep everyone tied in and, and talking to one another and uh, to keep them thinking about science and kind of focused on you know new ideas and, and ways to be productive uh, in a home setting. So I think that's been good at, at the level of managing the, the research group. Um, we've also uh, allowed students to take equipment home. So we had a intra-group kind of home lab competition to uh, see who had the fanciest, most enabling home lab. But, but you know, just involving electronic and mechanical instrumentation, no wet chemistry, obviously, we're kind of concerned about safety. But, but I think um, for many students in the group, that's actually turned out pretty well. So, so they're doing the best they can. Uh, we have other kinds of ways to, to keep people engaged, but that's kind of at the level of the research group. Also, as I'll outline uh, as part of this talk, we are actively engaged deploying our devices downtown across the medical community here in Chicago. And as a result, I, uh, a technician in, in the group, sort of the lead engineer, and about a half dozen of the group members have been designated as essential personnel to support those deployments. So there are some people in the group are still coming into the lab uh, every day. I'm in the lab right now, not the lab, but my office across the hall from the lab. So, so there's, there's that uh, as well. Um, I'm teaching two courses this quarter. So we've had to adapt them to an online format kind of on the fly as many other people have had to do as well. Um, but that, that's about it. Yeah, I mean, just trying to, trying to do, do the best we can, but um, uh, hopefully this this will end or, or gradually you know be, be phased out and we can get back to work in in the usual way. Yeah. So so I would imagine that uh, John, you are uh, you know you, you're mainly an experimentalist. Although I would also say that you've done a lot of theoretical work, computational work as well. But for people like you, this could also be an opportunity because there's so much to be done or so many interesting things to be done uh, in research. Yeah, I guess um, maybe there's a silver lining to all of this, I, I suppose, in a sense. Um, a lot of what we've been thinking about over the years are you know, advanced uh, technology systems for medical monitoring of, of various sorts, implantable skin interface devices. I think as um, and we go through this process, there's a greater and greater awareness of uh, precision medicine, digitally enabled medicine, uh, biosensors, that sort of thing, at home monitoring. And so in a way, there's kind of a resonance there uh, around topics that we were you know, previously working on and interested in. They've taken on a heightened level of uh, significance. And I suspect that that will be kind of a trend go going forward. There'll probably be a slight somewhat re realignment of um, you know, academic research priorities, you know, in the context of the, of the world that we're facing now, um, because this is probably not likely the last, you know, such event that we'll, we'll have to grapple with as a society. And so I think uh, remote engagement, um, like virtual reality, there's, there's a lot of, um, 
you know, drivers that, that are that are going to lead to the development of new technology, data, data analytics, and so on. So, so you know, if there's any you know positive coming out of all of this, I think it's uh, just creating new new motivating forces for for new ideas and new technology development. That's probably more broadly beneficial to society beyond just grappling and coping with um, you know you know this this particular pandemic. And that probably cuts across many different fields of study. But but I would agree with that. Yeah, very true, very true. Uh, but but you know we we live in challenging times or interesting times, you can say, and that reminds me of uh, the famous quote from uh, Winston Churchill: uh, "Never let the good crisis go to waste." So, <laughs> I think this is a good example that EML webinar series is a good example. Uh, certainly, uh, we didn't think about having a seminar uh, with participants halfway across the world uh, and you know uh, thousands of them participating in a research seminar like, like this so this is an opportunity uh, to a certain degree uh, as well so uh, i think for the type of work that you are doing certainly uh, collaborating with the medical community, uh, I would foresee that the impact of that would be quite significant. So uh, let's hope that we bring uh, something good to the world. And you know, uh, science never stops, research never stops. And uh, I think uh, we're first of all, looking forward to your uh, talk but also looking forward to uh, your sharing your uh, perspectives uh, under this interesting or difficult period of time. Yeah, it's a great opportunity. I appreciate um, you know, the chance to, to present some of our work and maybe share some ideas that others might find useful for their own research. I think this webinar series was Zhigong's uh, idea and I think it was a brilliant brilliant concept uh, to, to try to keep the community, you know, sharing and, and, and communicating, uh, uh, communicating with one, one another through, through this difficult period. So that there's certainly, you know, um, there's certainly maybe, maybe some good things that will come out of uh, all of this, but, but it's hard to think of it purely in that way, given the economic deficit, devastation and the, and the health, you know, um, crisis that, that's going on in, in parallel, but, but we try to do the best we can and, Try to find ways to, to improve and, and, and contribute. Yeah. So so we have a few minutes. Uh, maybe I'll ask, I'll ask some. Uh, uh, I hope you don't mind more personal questions. When did you realize that you are a very good scientific researcher? Uh -huh. <laughs> I don't know. That's probably a very gradual, very slow process. I'm not even sure I'm there yet. <laughs> you know, I've good students and good collaborators and. Uh, you know, we've picked a few problems that I think over over time have have been wise choices of things to to work on. Pro probably is is the maybe the most important thing, and then uh, the ability to assemble good people around those those directions. So, so I I wouldn't say you know we're satisfied by by any means. For for us, you know, interdisciplinary work and collaboration and great students, I mean, I think is the main main driver. And I just try to keep the operation funded and more or less headed in a, in a productive uh, direction. I, it, hard for me to take take credit for much of, much of it, but uh, I think we, we've, um, you know, had fun and try, try to work on important problems. I mean, I think that's, that's our, you know, um, outlook. But, but I think, you know, maybe more directly to, to your question, my, my father had, has a PhD in physics and so I just felt like I would go kind of in that direction in one way or another, but probably not until, you know, late into my uh, PhD period did I kind of get comfortable with the idea that I could kind of do this stuff. You know, I think the first couple of years, a little bit uncertain for me and, and thinking about, you know, different types of career options. I thought pretty, pretty deeply about patent law, actually, <laughs> just because I felt like that would be an interesting way to stay at the forefront of many different fields of study and um, uh, stay intellectually stimul stimulated in that way. But then I figured, you know, um, 
maybe, maybe I was better at kind of doing research. And that's probably the key to, to developing, you know, anyone's career is to like try to figure out what you're good at and then just do that, you know? And, and so I think once you have an idea of that, then uh, that, that's a, that's a really great guiding force, right. In, in terms of making, you know, career decisions. And, and for me, that probably didn't happen until maybe third or fourth year of graduate school, I, I would say. But, you know, I think limited, still limited confidence, but confident enough that I could be successful going in this particular direction with, with my career. That's, hey, that's hey, John. Hey, John. Uh, Tang Li here. Just want to say hi and uh, say thank uh -huh. you for giving this uh, EML uh, webinar. Uh, the title of your EML webinar is uh, very intriguing given this uh, current situation. I just want to echo uh, what uh, Jimmy just mentioned, the uh, quote from uh, Winston Churchill. Uh, there were discussions in the WeChat group uh, a couple of days ago on this uh, EML web webinar and uh, the uh, situation ongoing. I think uh, there is a, in parallel, the uh, Asian, the Chinese wisdom, uh, we call it the Wei Ji. Wei means crisis and the Ji means opportunities. This word actually always come together. So I think your uh, uh, webinar, looking forward to uh, listening to your webinar today uh, is another example of uh, this uh, uh, crisis and the opportunities. Looking forward to your webinar. Thank you. Yeah, thank you for that, yeah. Uh, interesting. So, so uh, at one time you were, you were actually thinking of becoming a patent lawyer or patent attorney. Uh, that's the kind of work that uh, Albert Einstein was doing, perhaps, or close to that. Yeah, that was not a motivating consideration at all. That was purely a coincidence. But uh, yeah, I, I did think about it. I actually signed up to take the LSAT and was going to think about law school and all that kind of stuff, but. Interesting. I'm doing that. <laughs> so, so I do uh, like what, what? ideas, you know, I'm sort of attracted to ideas and, and, and new concepts and sort of the creative aspect of scientific research, which is obviously kind of an important part of the enterprise. And maybe that's why I, at that point, was kind of attracted to intellectual property law and, and, and patent law. Yeah. So uh, for the benefit of uh, young researchers in the audience, uh, can you reflect on your research career and saying, uh, you know, share some experiences uh, at what stage you feel that your career really took off? Uh, I think the, the transformative experience for, for me was um, as a junior fellow at Harvard and being in George Whiteside's group. You know, I think um, mm -hmm. MIT was great. And um, I think I felt, I felt like I learned how to do like really difficult, hard experiments uh, at MIT. But at Harvard, um, sort of my notions of um, scientific research and how to pick problems to work on and how to think about, you know, um, not just ivory tower research, but research that could lead to impactful uh, outcomes, either at a commercial level or maybe just at a broader societal level. I think that was kind of a transformative experience for me in, in learning from, from George. I, I think he has a wonderful outlook and, and understanding of how to do meaningful research and um, how to really build creative ideas into, into the process in a very powerful way. And so I, at MIT, I think I maybe had an experience or, or uh, a chance to learn how to do hard ex experiments. And at Harvard, I learned how to do simple experiments and simple things and, mm -hmm. and, and simple but, but valuable uh, ideas. And I think that's powerful because it's usually the simple stuff that really works. And so that's kind of um, been, been an attitude that we've tried to, to maintain over time. And I think capping uh, off my Harvard experience with uh, a period at Bell Labs really kind of solidified that worldview, sort of a Bell Labsian um, perspective on, on how to do things and, uh, and how to combine science with engineering to, to address meaningful problems. So, so that really set, set the stage for you know, how I've tried to uh, configure my, my research and, and my research group uh, ever since with that 
you know, aspiration, I guess, to try to do world-class science, but not kind of in a vacuum, cho choosing problems whose solutions, you know, uh, have, have real meaning, you know, beyond journal papers and so on. And so we try to do the best we can. I mean, I, it, it's hard to, to, to realize that vision, I, I guess, but um, I, I think for us, it's a good way to uh, put together, you know, programs of research. Okay, so uh, we've passed 10 o'clock. Uh, should we wait just a few minutes, maybe a couple of minutes or so to let people join? Uh, let's give it maybe a few no, minutes. We have a, a minute. That's fine with me. I'm, I don't have a hard stop. I, I don't know about the way the, the, the Zoom call is set up or whatever, but. Okay. Uh, for some reason, your voice, John, is uh, a little crackling. I don't know whether it's my uh, issue over here in Singapore. Uh, Zhugang Tang, do you hear this? Is, is John's voice? John's voice okay. is very clear. Your voice. Uh, uh, yeah, sometimes uh, it is so clear. Just uh, okay. from time to time, there is some uh, uh, voice issue, but uh, I think uh, uh, it's okay. Yeah. Okay, so so it must be my end. I'm trying to figure out uh, whose end uh, the issue was. Okay, uh, let's start. Uh, maybe let me start by saying. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, good evening, uh, depending on where you are from uh, in the world, or maybe just good day. Uh, uh, my name is Jimmy Xia. I'm a faculty member at Nanyang Technological University in Singapore, or NTU in Singapore. I'm also a co-editor-in-chief uh, of Experimental mecha uh, 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 Mechanics, uh, ex Extreme Mechanics Letters, EML. And today we have, uh, we are very happy to have Professor John Rogers of uh, Northwestern University to be our speaker uh, for this uh, EML webinar. And as we uh, mentioned in our flyer, John is the world foremost trailblazer in the rapidly advancing field of bio-integrated electronics. His work bridges chemistry, material science, and mechanics, and trans transcends the boundary between science, engineering, and medicine. So uh, John uh, needs very little introduction. Uh, in fact, uh, I, I first met John when we were both on the faculty of University of Illinois, Urbana-Champaign, and I went to, I still remember, I went to his office and to talk about some research ideas. And after that, we've had so many meetings and every single one of them, I must say, uh, has been very inspirational, okay? Uh, and uh, John's achievements would be too long to list. I would strongly suggest that uh, you all go to John's research website and to take a look. Uh, but uh, uh, don't forget to look at the picture. You know, on the website, John has a very cool picture with a pair of sneakers, uh, blue jeans, and the sleeves rolled up, uh, ready to go into the garage to, to do some work. Uh, you know, it's just a cool guy uh, uh, as a researcher, but also uh, something that people perhaps don't know too well is uh, John is also an entrepreneur. So he's a co-founder of a company called MC10, uh, headquartered in, I believe, Lexington, Massachusetts or Cambridge, Massachusetts, one of those places. Uh, the company is making all kinds of cool uh, flexible electronics devices. So without further 
do uh, let's uh, let me pass the podium almost exactly halfway across the world from Singapore to Chicago, Illinois. And John's going to talk about enabling ideas in the mechanics of bio-integrated electronic systems from COVID-19 patients to engineered mini brains. John, the floor is yours. Okay, great. Thank you very much, uh, Jimmy. It's always nice to be introduced by, by a friend uh, and a collaborator. And so that was a very unusual introduction, but, but I enjoyed it. <laughs> so it's a great uh, opportunity to have a chance to share with everyone on the call some of the things that we've been thinking about and, and working on uh, very very recently, actually, I really, really kind of focus on the most recent results out, out of the group, a little bit of historical context, uh, but not much. Um, with with um, you know, examples of, of application, so, so really some foundational ideas in material science and mechanical engineering that have worked out pretty well for us in the development of biocompatible or what we refer to as biointegrated electronic systems. But, uh, developing those uh, kinds of technologies, not in a vacuum, but with uh, a set of applications sort of uh, in mind, near-term and, and long-term uh, applications. And um, so I'll, I'll begin kind of with a background and, and I kind of focus on some of the un underpinning mechanics principles uh, at specifically, but, but really transition quickly fr from those uh, foundational ideas into uh, system level embodiments of technologies that have broader utility. And um, when I put this um, abstract uh, together, it was you know a week and a half ago, and, and a lot of things have happened since then, specifically around our activities to try to uh, assist with uh, you know the pandemic and, and to you know take a look at the use of our technologies in, in the context of the care of patients and uh, frontline health uh, care workers in, in, in the COVID. 19 wards here across the uh, medical complex here in Chicago. And so I ended up with a lot more content in that um, on that topic than, than I initially anticipated that I would have. And so the talk is uh, going to be pretty heavy on the front end. And if I have time, I'll, I'll talk about you know, some more research oriented academic um, you know, efforts that we have in uh, next generation biointegrated systems, that is 3D. Uh, electronic frameworks that we're using uh, as interfaces to uh, cortical spheroids or organoids, sometimes referred to as mini brains. So it's possible that I'll run out of time and, and I won't have an opportunity to go through that content because I think this uh, this topic of COVID is is maybe uh, you know of, of greater interest to to the audience um, than than that last bit of work. But we'll see see how it goes. If, if there is time, of course, I'll go through it. So um, just as background, you know, my uh, core area of expertise is uh, material science and engineering, but we do a lot in, in the realm of mechanical science and engineering as well, not, not just in my group, but through uh, deep uh, collaborations with Professor Yang Gong Huang and, and many others who are real experts in, in mechanical science. But we also do a lot of electrical engineering, biomedical engineering, very um, interdisciplinary uh, in a sense. And I think that will come out as I step through uh, the, the slides here. But before I even do that, I just want to acknowledge uh, the sponsorship of this uh, webinar by Extreme Mechanics Letters and El Salvier, um, El Sevier. And uh, this was uh, Zhigang Suo, uh, Suo's idea. And, and I think it's a great uh, mechanism for bringing the mechanics community uh, together and also uh, an opportunity to sort of highlight the journal, which is a relatively new journal, but, but I think it's a, a, a cool type of journal in the sense that it's uh, you know designed around rapid publication and interdisciplinary focus with mechanical science uh, at, at the core, but in all sorts of aspects of e extreme uh, mechanics and, and extreme uh, materials. And um, you know, it's been going very well. You know, we, we stood this journal up uh, a few years back. It, it does now have an impact factor, which, which is pretty strong and, and getting stronger uh, over time. So this is the number from uh, 2019, and you can see it benchmarked against other mechanics journals and other sort of physics and, and materials oriented uh, journals. So it's been a great uh, opportunity for me to, to, to be a part of this uh, journal and, and, and putting it together. And it's extreme in the content, but it's also extreme in terms of the editors. We have a really extremely talented uh, collection of editors uh, that's really dedicated to handling uh, submissions uh, at a very high level scientifically, but also very rapidly. Uh, and, and so th this, is a, this is a really great team. And if you are doing research in this area, I'd really encourage you to think about this journal as a target 
uh, for for publishing uh, your your work. Um, so with that, let me let me just give give a high level overview of what kind of we're we're attempting to do and and uh, striving to to accomplish uh, from from the standpoint of academic materials and mechanics uh, research, and that really is to uh, reformulate the kind of uh, electronics that that underpin consumer electronic gadgetry, cell phones, laptop computers, and so on, into biocompatible forms, both at the level of the constituent materials, but also at the level of the geometries and the mechanics uh, of those uh, electronic platforms. So, so think about thin, soft membranes uh, that support all the same kind of sophisticated electronic functionality that you would see in, in a smartphone or, or in a microprocessor or in a laptop, but, but configured to enable a, a soft, non-invasive, long-lived, stable interface to, to the brain where that electronic functionality could be used to tease out basic operating principles of, of the brain and, and also maybe stimulate the brain in ways that could uh, eliminate various sorts of uh, disorders. So thinking about it as a discovery tool for neuroscience, but also uh, an engineering form of medicine, in a sense, to treat uh, disease. And um, you know, trying to accomplish that is uh, it's not easy, but but we think uh, a successful effort would be, you know, impactful not not only for for brain science and and uh, brain disorders, but also uh, as platforms that could be uh, integrated with other vital organ systems of the body. We've done a lot around uh, heart integrated systems uh, on the epicardial outside surface of the heart, the inside surface as well. Uh, kidneys, um, uh, peripheral nerves, spinal cord, bladder, a number of different uh, points of integration turn out to be uh, of interest for uh, implants of, of that sort. Uh, but as a non-invasive means to deploy these kind of technologies uh, uh, quickly and in the near term, skin is particularly interesting um, because it's the body's largest uh, organ and, and the skin can be used as an interface for uh, very high quality measurements of underlying physiological processes. So think about ICU grade um, you know, medical monitoring, but, but in devices that softly laminate onto the skin, melt into the surface of the epidermis uh, in a sense to provide that same kind of functionality, but outside of a hospital or laboratory setting continuously and wirelessly uh, in the home as, as uh, individuals go about their natural sort of normal daily activities is sort, sort of the way that we uh, think about it. So if you, uh, you know, are interested in integrating with biology, it's used to, useful to think about engineering principles that, that are common in biological systems. And this slide just provides a, a rough overview, nothing too insightful here, but just to orient you and remind you of the sophistication that's present in, in biology. It involves functional components with lake, length scales all the way from the atomic and molecular scale uh, in, in dimension all the way up to, to macroscopic body scale uh, structures. It's hard materials integrated with soft materials in mechanically optimized ways. It's uh, three-dimensional uh, architectures. It's reconfigurability. It's uh, you know, multi-component and multi-functional. Uh, and so, so as part of these efforts in uh, biocompatible, bio-integrated electronic systems, we like to keep in mind these design features and try to not mimic them, but, but adapt them and, and, and apply them to, to man-made systems in, in ways that, that facilitate that, that type of integration over time. And so for us, there have been kind of three main thrusts of work in this broader area. One is in the development of sort of mechanically soft membranes that I referred to previously for integration with, with the skin, the brain, the heart, the bladder, the kidneys, and so on. Uh, and this is um, you know, a primary uh, focus of a lot of our research where you know, the engineering capabilities have now risen to a level that allows us to, to really deploy these devices at scale on human patients. And that'll be a main focus of, of this talk. Uh, another uh, direction is uh, driven a little bit more by fundamental material science, and that uh, is, is around the question of how to build biodegradable or like physically transient uh, implantable systems. So high quality electronics that are water soluble to track and monitor and stimulate and deliver therapies in the context of transient time dependent biological processes where these systems can be designed to disappear naturally without a trace after they're no longer needed, after their operational lifetime has exceeded the, the relevant time scale of the biological process that, uh, that's being targeted. So that's kind of physically transient. And then the third topic, as I mentioned before, if I have time to get it, then, then I'll uh, bring, bring you up to speed on what, what we're thinking about in this area, is really to think uh, about ways to do integration with bio biology beyond the level of surfaces 
uh, into 3D volumetric spaces. And, and so thinking about open network architectures, which are ubiquitous in biology, how do you do that with electronics? And then, and then if, if you can do that, how, how do you integrate those kind of electronic frameworks with living uh, systems to allow uh, fundamental studies or maybe advanced forms of uh, therapies and, and, and monitoring capabilities? So let me start with uh, some ideas, again, mechanical uh, science-based uh, uh, you know, ideas around how do you generate soft uh, sort of tissue compatible electronics and, and sort of motivate uh, you know, that uh, work by, by asking the question of why, why would one want to spend time on that topic when there's already uh, you know, a huge variety of wearable devices commercially uh, on the market today. And um, that would be a reasonable question and it's just useful to highlight that although there's a diversity of devices that are, that are available commercially as wearables, uh, they all uh, involve pretty primitive engineering designs at, at the level of biointegration. So it's a rigid block of electronics loosely strapped to the body, usually uh, at, at the wrist. And uh, that's good for a lot of things, counting steps, maybe it's okay, you know, you can uh, monitor activity, you can get a rough estimate of heart rate, you can get episodic measurements of uh, ECG. Uh, traces with the latest uh, Apple Watch, but but it's very hard to recapitulate sort of ICU grade monitoring that that's done routinely in the hospital with a device that's really not intimately physically in contact with the body with with the skin. So these so these are great devices, but I think they will fall fundamentally short of an ultimate goal in medical grade uh, you know monitoring, and that that's our primary uh, interest. And so. The, the reason why th those devices have the forms that they do uh, has to do with the fact that all uh, you know, electronic systems that have built, been built and uh, sold uh, commercially since the very earliest days of the in industry, starting with the invention of the transistor, have been constructed on semiconductor wafer platforms, which are spectacularly well-developed pieces of materials technology uh, but they're not biocompatible in any sense uh, that, that we like to think about. They're perfectly planar, they're rigid, they're brittle. It's hard to um, you know, uh, see how one could take a wafer-based platform of electronics and integrate it with the, with the brain or the heart or, or, or the skin. And so the question is, what do you do about that? And, and how do you overcome that dramatic mismatch in, in geometry and, and mechanics and, and underlying materials? A lot of the materials that you find in a silicon integrated circuit are intrinsically incompatible or, or, or toxic. So how do you overcome all of those considerations? And one stream of work uh, that's very interesting, and we've uh, been, been engaged in, in that direction as well, is to kind of throw out silicon, for example, and try to develop uh, from the ground uh, new, new classes of uh, electronic materials that, that would allow that kind of bio uh, integration. The other uh, route would be a little bit focused more on mechanics and less on materials, where um, the goal would be to stick with silicon, but deploy it in geometries and in um, you know, nanostructured uh, forms uh, combined with soft materials to uh, you know, achieve the kind of uh, mechanics and geometry that, that would uh, be needed for biointegration, but without abandoning silicon and some of the other very highly developed classes of inorganic sort of hard brittle um, you know, functional materials. And it's really that second strategy that, that's worked best for us in terms of driving the technology to a point that you can actually uh, you know, deploy it uh, in, in, into the real world and, and begin to do meaningful uh, things. And so I'll just very quickly highlight the underlying mechanics. I mean, for, for a mechanics audience, these concepts are going to be super simple. But you know, per, per the George Whiteside's uh, worldview, I, I think simple is a good thing, not not a bad thing. And so, so that that's kind of been our attitude. So, so how would you uh, configure silicon in a way that would allow integration with the brain? Well, you do a couple of things. One is you'd make it super thin because that would drive the bending stiffness. Uh, down to very very low levels due to the fact that uh, the stiffness is scaling with the cube of the of the thickness, uh, and so you know as you scale from a wafer down to let's say a nano membrane of silicon, you save you know 15 orders of magnitude in bending stiffness, and that's a huge qualitative change in the way you think about the material. So that'd be one simple idea: maintain monocrystalline sort of device grade silicon, but think about it in the form of uh, nanoscale membranes rather than wafers. Uh, at the level of bending stiffness, that's important. But then also uh, in the sense of degree of bendability, uh, you also benefit from uh, scaling the thickness uh, down. So for a given radius of curvature, the bending uh, strains go down linearly with thickness. So it ends up uh, you know, creating, by, by forming silicon into these nanomembranes, you end up with something that's very floppy and also very flexible. 
but it's not a direct one-to-one -one replacement for the wafer because it's not mechanically robust. You can't really handle uh, you know, a, a circuit that's built on a, a nanomembrane of silicon. So you really have to think about this as a building block material, not a substrate that you could integrate with uh, a plastic or elastomer substrate to, to build out the mechanics. And um, you know, that, that becomes a challenge in uh, interface mechanics and how do you manage um, you know, the, the adhesion at that uh, interface. And there as well, you know, thickness comes to your uh, rescue because the energy release rates are scaling down linearly with the thickness. So as you, as you go to these nanoscale uh, dimensions, it becomes more and more straightforward to uh, perform that heterogeneous integration and, and to maintain a robust adhesion and bonding. Uh, between silicon and let's say silicone. So those, those are some simple ideas. Uh, it doesn't get you all the way there, however. Uh, if you have a thin piece of silicon, you do have something that's very flexible and floppy. You put it on a piece of plastic, now you have you know, the basis for a flexible uh, circuit technology, but, but it's still not offering tissue-like mechanics because uh, it doesn't stretch and, and you can't wrap complex curvilinear surfaces if uh, your, your system can only bend. And so you, there you have to think about uh, you know, ways to achieve effective levels of stretchability. And these really bi build on ideas that, that came out of uh, Zhigang uh, Suo's work and Sigurd Wagner and, uh, and George Whiteside's in uh, buckled films of gold, but, but you can do similar things with silicon. And so this is an example of strips of silicon uh, bonded in a wavy geometry to an underlying soft elastomer substrate. And now from a material science perspective, you have a hard soft composite structure where the hard material, the silicon is providing the electronic functionality, the soft component is giving you the elastic mechanics. You put it all together, you end up with something that gives you sort of end-to-end -end effective levels of linear elastic stretchability, but in a way that doesn't lead to uh, fracture-inducing strains in the silicon, which will crack at about a 1% tensile strain. So that's the idea. You can uh, get a lot more sophisticated with those basic concepts instead of just exploiting out of plane kind of buckling that wavy geometry. You can structure the silicon or the other sort of inorganic functional materials into um, you know, buckled or wavy geometries in the plane as well. So now you're thinking about filamentary serpentine uh, networks, thin strips of material, again, integrated with a soft elastomer substrate, but with quantitative um, you know, guidance through 3D uh, finite element modeling uh, that, that's been led by a uh, you know, long-term collaborator of, of ours, Professor Young Young Huang here at, at Northwestern. And if you really pay attention to the fine-grained details associated with the mechanics, you can design these systems to offer stress-strain behaviors that are really quantitatively matched to uh, target tissues uh, of interest, in spite of the fact that you can have very high modulus materials embedded on these uh, on these filaments. So, so silicon 150 gigapascal with this kind of architecture and a soft elastomer substrate with a modulus of 50 kilopascal, you can generate kind of an effective mechanical metamaterial or, or designer uh, uh, composite that has stress strain properties uh, matched to skin, which as a module, it's around 150 kilopascal. So it's really experimental science, material science combined with computational mechanics that allow you to begin to, to do these things. Uh, and you can actually get even more sophisticated. Most biological materials show this characteristic J-shaped stress strain uh, response. And, and you can really engineer these deterministic composites to, to match not only the linear part of this stress strain um, uh, relationship, but, but the full uh, nonlinear shape as well. So you, so you can design these things to have tangential moduli that change uh, in, in an expected way, a biological type of way with, with strain. And that involves just really tailoring the key dimensions of these, uh, these filaments to, to achieve that outcome. And so with inverse computational approaches, again, led by Professor Yanggong Huang's uh, group, you can run FEA, uh, design these architectures to, to match stress strain properties of really any kind of material. This is skin from different uh, regions of the body to regions of the back, the abdomen. And then you can go off based on that uh, modeling uh, guidance, go off and, and build systems to those specs. Uh, and, and you can see the level, level of agreement you can, you can achieve in that way. So anyway, just some simple ideas pushed to you know, fairly high levels of uh, engineering uh, you know, uh, uh, sophistication allows you to do these things. Now, if you think about it, you know, those horseshoe shaped uh, serpentine filaments are pretty simple geometries. Um, you know, would there be more complex geometries that would provide even greater levels of stretchability in systematic sort of geometric constructs that would allow you to automate the process of filling an area with a filament of material with, you know, uh, consideration around 
uh, overall area coverage for electronic functionality, but also in, in a geometric layout that gives you the mechanics that you ultimately want. And in that context, we found that uh, fractal mathematics tur turns out to be a, a very useful type of design strategy. The self-similarity of these fractal curves uh, essentially generate uh, a hierarchy of springs from the standpoint of the mechanics and they're very systematic ways to uh, fill 2D spaces with these kind of fractal uh, curve, different sorts of uh, basis sets. And uh, you know, fractal mathematics is a very old field of study, but to our knowledge, nobody took a look at the uh, mechanics of fractals in, in this con uh, particular context. And so that, that turns out to be uh, you know, a very powerful idea that, that we use quite a bit. Uh, these days as, as a way to design system architectures. So that's um, kind of um, you know a few statements around the underlying mechanics, composite deterministic materials design from, from the vantage of um, you know um, elastic, elasticity and, and modulus. But but geometric you know conformality is also very very important whether you're thinking about um, sort of laminating onto the brain or, or the heart or the skin. And that's what's shown here. This is a polymer replica of human skin. And you can see the kind of uh, degree of contact that's possible with these, these kind of filamentary serpentine mesh type structures. And that's very important to uh, enable robust adhesion uh, against these uh, complex textured uh, surfaces, but, but also from the standpoint of impedance, where you're using the skin to, to measure underlying physiological processes. You'd like to have excellent contact, physical contact, in order to do that kind of uh, measurement, again, uh, at this sort of uh, ICU uh, grade level of, of quality uh, in, in data uh, fidelity. So that, that's about it. I mean, that, that's, uh, you know, an overview, uh, a quick tour of the, the basic concepts that have worked pretty, pretty well for us. We felt like we were getting pretty comfortable with it around 2011, uh, got a lot better in 2014, and uh, felt like we, we had all the, the key pieces of technology that would allow us to begin to address real unmet clinical needs, is to basically take these technology ideas and build them into platforms that are actually useful in, in clinical medicine. And so, so that's kind of what, what I'm going to pivot toward. But before I do, do that, I would just mention that um, you know, these kinds of um, ideas in, in materials and mechanics are quite uh, generalizable in the sense that uh, those sorts of filamentary serpentine uh, architectures can support all kinds of function, you know, uh, all, all the way from electronic function, but but as importantly, uh, function at the level of biosensors uh, as well. And so you can begin to uh, do sort of clinical grade measurements of things like, you know, uh, electrocardiography. Electrocardi so not just heart rate and heart rate variability, but the full waveform associated with a cardiac beat cycle. And a cardiologist understands how to interpret this data. So, so if you can collect clinical grade data of this quality in the home setting, then a physician can do something with that uh, as opposed to uh, a more qualitative measurement that's possible with a traditional wearable around just a rough estimate of heart rate or, or steps or activity level. But you can go beyond that. All kinds of things uh, that are done in the hospital really require that intimate skin interface. And whenever that's the case, uh, you can bring to bear the, these new sort of skin-like electronic and biosensor uh, uh, platforms to bear. So another uh, case of a, a skin interface measurement is hydration, typically done with a corneometer, but you can do that as well with these kinds of uh, platforms. You can measure very precisely the moisture level of the skin, and that turns out to be uh, a good metric for diagnosing various uh, dermatological skin conditions, essentially. You can also do um, uh, pressure sensors, so you can measure um, the time dynamics of pulsatile blood flow through near surface arteries. That's called arterial tonometry, typically used uh, in the clinic uh, and, and uh, relying on a, a bulky strapped on device. Now you can do that uh, in, in these skin like formats. And so, so those are the kinds of things that I think are useful to start with. Like, how do you replicate what physicians are familiar with today? But you don't need to stop there because uh, these types of technologies allow maybe new measurement capabilities or new. Uh, mounting locations on, on the body that will allow you to do, do things beyond clinical standard. And I think that represents a, an exciting frontier in this space. And just give you a sense, I mean, these devices, they, they certainly can go beyond just the wrist. You put, put them really wherever you want uh, on the body because, because they're skin-like, there's, there's very little mechanical load or uh, surface irritation associated with uh, these devices. You need to put them on very sensitive regions of the, the body, like the, the neck. And we were kind of playing around with this in, back in 2016, just, just looking at monitoring vibratory patterns of speech. And so you can do speech recognition without a microphone, which is powerful because you're independent then of ambient noise. 
And so this is something we're just playing around with. It turns out to be critically important for what we're doing with COVID-19 patients, as I'll describe uh, in a little bit. So I just want to kind of for foreshadow that. But the point is you can do all sorts of uh, uh, types of sensing. And uh, we're not the only ones, obviously, working in this uh, space. Many, many excellent groups around, uh, around the globe publishing all kinds of new ideas and skin interface sensors. And I think it's become a really rich area of, of research and, and one that uh, has a very strong potential to be high, highly impactful uh, as well as the community drives you know, the capabilities forward. I, I think that the utility is, is going to be very, very powerful across a range of types of patients and a range of disease conditions. So I won't go through the details, all kinds of thermal, electrical, fluidic, mechanical, optical, mechanoacoustic, that's kind of within the realm of the speech recognition. But going beyond that, thinking about the body as a mechanic system, like how do you characterize body processes just based on mechanical signatures or acoustic signatures, body sounds, thinking about next generation of uh, stethoscope type, type technology, go, going beyond a digital stethoscope to a, a skin-like uh, device that's operating in a wireless fashion. Again, I'll come back to that concept uh, in a little bit, but, but I think there are a lot of things to be done. Uh, in, when, when you view the, the human body as a, as a mechanics system, um, so let me give you one, one specific example. It's one that we've really targeted uh, since about 2015, 2016. Really asking the question is where would a skin-like wireless technology have the most impact across all types of patients? And we decided early on that the most fragile, maybe the most precious patients that you would find in a hospital, premature babies, could uh, benefit most strongly, uh, that the case would be most compelling for introduction of a skin-like wireless platform, because what's done with premature babies, they're in a fragile health status, they need to be monitored 24-7, they go into what's called a neonatal intensive care unit, and in that unit, they have to be monitored 24-7, uh, all vital signs, clinical grade quality, and the way that's done is with biosensors taped to the skin, wired connections to external boxes of electronics. And while you can collect that in that way, it's not very good for the babies because these tapes have to be strong enough to keep the biosensors adhered to the skin in the presence of forces that are inevitably applied to that interface through the, the wires. Uh, and the tapes have to be removed uh, every 24 hours, typically 24 hour cycle. The, the skin is not very well developed. So in many cases, uh, peeling this uh, tape back peels the skin away as well and causes injuries that can sometimes lead to lifetime scarring. The other thing is the, the wires are heavy and bulky. They frustrate natural movements of the baby. They frustrate even the most basic aspects of clinical care. And maybe more importantly, they prevent the kind of uh, parent-child interactions and skin-skin contact that's known to be so important for healthy development of these babies. So around 2016 or so, we decided if we could really make these skin interface wireless devices work in the way that we had hoped, we get rid of all these wires, all this rat's nest of stuff, get rid of the tapes uh, and replace them with much um, you know, more patient-friendly and, and parent-friendly technologies, nurse-friendly as well. And, and this was just a, a Photoshop version of what we had hoped to achieve as an old slide maybe uh, generated in 20, 2016. But it turns out you can do all of that. It's basically the same ideas I just described to you, but implemented at a very high level of uh, engineering um, uh, refinement, uh, I suppose. And um, we can do it with two devices, one show, shown here that goes on the chest, uh, another one that goes on the foot or the hand, and they operate in a wireless battery-free way, uh, and you can capture all vital signs at clinical grade quality. So let me just step you through that. I won't go through the details it's outside of the scope of this uh, talk, but it's basically these kind of fractal type design approaches, filamentary serpentines, in this case, in this peanut-shaped structure for an antenna that's doing wireless data transmission and also wireless energy harvesting from an antenna that sits under the base of the isolate. This goes on the chest. It measures uh, the skin temperature on the chest. It also captures continuous ECG. This is electrocardiography. We're doing this at the same time, and this is on a neonate in uh, a NICU unit at Lurie Children's Hospital here in Chicago. So we're doing the same old wired-based uh, data collection while we're doing wireless skin-like device data collection as well. So we get a one-to-one -one comparison and qualitative validation of the technology. You can see the, the alignment's pretty good here. So with the ECG, you get heart rate, heart rate variability. You can also get respiration rate from this data, and you also get a measurement of temperature. So that gets you part of the way there. But if you're going into the NICU and your goal is to eliminate wires, you have to eliminate all of the wires because if even one pair of wires uh, re remains, you, you've lost a lot of the value. So you really have to do everything and you can't do everything from the chest. You need 
to be able to measure blood oxygenation as well. And that comes to the second platform that I mentioned, still skin-like in its mechanics, in its geometry, in its thickness, its thermal mass, and its physical mass, battery-free, there's the antenna. In this case, it's not an electronic interface, it's an optical interface, red and IR uh, LEDs blinking on and off out of phase, an integrated photo detector, and then wireless data streaming allows you to do photoplethysmography, and this is the type of raw data you obtain, and from these data, you can determine blood oxygenation. So it turns out all of that works. Uh, we started deployments about two and a half years ago at Lurie Children's. We're up to well over 100 babies that we've done testing on uh, with no uh, adverse events. Uh, gestational age is down to 26 weeks, so 24 weeks is the edge of viability, so about half of the 24-week deliveries don't make it, so this is about as small as you uh, a baby that you would encounter in a NICU, works very well there. We also have to do a lot on the software side. I'll come back to that in the context of COVID-19. You know, if you want to you know, develop a new hardware technology, it's got to be paired with software that the nurses and physicians can use. If they can't use it, they won't use it and you can't get any traction. So we had to develop internal into the group software expertise. And this is a graphical user interface for the nurses replicating uh, what they're used to uh, in the GE dash systems down to the color of the traces and the font sizes and the uh, font types and, and the rest of it. But, but this uh, turn, turns out to work very well. This is what it looks like on a 31 week old uh, baby. You can see the device on the chest. There's the wired systems. This hand here, that's Aaron Hanvas. He's head of na neonatology at Lurie Children's, just to give you a sense of uh, what this looks like. We've uh, had great success in the NICU. We've also migrated now into the PICU, which is a pediatric intensive care unit. A little bit larger babies uh, in, in that facility, but they still require 24-7 uh, monitoring. They still require the wires, and so going wireless, going skin-like has a lot of uh, value in that context. You can see the chest unit, the foot unit there, uh, and the babies are very happy. The nurses, the parents, everyone uh, is, is very, very enthusiastic about this type of uh, type of effort and this type of technology. This picture is nice because the baby's rotating around. You can see how the skin is naturally wrinkling, and the devices are just following that natural wrinkling without any mechanical constraint. And that that's the whole goal around the mechanical science that underpins these devices, this skin-like construction. And by doing that, you reduce the modulus, you reduce the thickness, you drive the interface stresses down. And that's important in terms of skin irritation, but it also allows us to get by with an adhesive, an adhesive that's 10 times less strong than the adhesive tapes that are used for, for the wire-based sensor. So removing these devices is highly non-invasive. The skin is, is never damaged or, or torn in that context. So I'm going to show a, a short video. This is just a three-minute uh, video to give you a sense of the parent's perspective, uh, the nurse's perspective, and the physician's perspective on this technology. It's hard for me to do that through, through slides. And this is a piece that was uh, featured on CBS this morning about one year ago. Uh, just to give you a sense of this, John LaPou came in and uh, did some filming and did some interviewing. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to roll this at, uh, at, at this point. Uh, this is not working. Let me just, um, I think the, um, if I restart my PowerPoint, sometimes the uh, videos don't, don't play, but just give me a second. Get this going. John, uh, if the video is playing, it's just uh, it's not showing in uh, uh, to the to the audience. Oh, it's not showing to the. Oh, I'm sorry, yeah. I didn't share my screen. I didn't share my screen back again. Hold on one second. Uh, let's see. Um, 
Thanks for letting me know. <laughs> it's hard, hard to see what's if going If you on. can go to the video playing uh, yeah, place yeah, and I'll, then I'll share that. Yeah, yeah, okay. yeah I'll, I'll do it here in a second. So. Okay, you, can you see it now? Yeah. yeah. Okay, sorry about that. <laughs> We are focusing on a tiny skin sensor that may revolutionize healthcare. Skin like silicon patches are being tested to monitor stroke recovery and breathing disorders. A new study in the journal Science shows how they could also help babies who are born prematurely. Researchers found wireless sensors attached to the chest and foot prove just as reliable as traditional electrodes for tracking babies' heart and respiration rates, temperature, blood oxygen levels, and blood pressure. Dr. John LaPook got a close look at this new technology. John, good morning. Good morning, John. Each year, 300,000 American newborns are admitted to the neonatal ICU, the NICU. At any moment, an alarm may signal that they need help. The new ultra-thin electronic patches could break preemies free of the wires that monitor them and safely allow them a less confined start to life. When Olivia McDonough arrived 15 days ahead of schedule, she needed surgery to help her breathe and swallow. Her first two weeks were spent wired to machines at Chicago's Lurie Children's Hospital, watched closely by her mom, Casey. It's just a constant reminder that we're here and that she's maybe not yet a normal newborn baby. All these wires monitor a newborn's breathing and circulation and alert doctors to any sign of infection. When you're breastfeeding, is it a little bit clunkier to we're have tangled. the wires? We're You guys can tell just by how we're standing right here. We're, uh, we're tethered and uh -huh. we're kind of at the mercy of the cords. Oh, yes. Now, a collaboration between doctors and engineers at Northwestern University has given birth to these skin-like wireless sensors. It's ticklish feet. Fine metal threads capture information like vital signs and oxygen levels. An antenna under the crib powers the sensors and streams data to a monitoring station. Now, I'm personally very excited about the possibility of using engineering to improve human health. For more than a decade, John Rogers and his research team have been fine-tuning this sensor technology. Even though this looks like we might be in an ICU, we're in your lab, so you're able to figure out all the ins and outs. Yeah, it's really important to think about the full picture. We had a clear vision. This is where we wanted to end up. We couldn't be happier with the outcome. <laughs> the sensors are gentle on fragile neonatal skin, which is 40 to 60 percent thinner than that of an adult. Study co-author Dr. Amy Paller treats skin injuries in preemies. 45 percent of them come away with some kind of scars from procedures and from the adhesives that attach them to these various wired devices. Those wireless patches allow parents to do something they're wired to do cuddle with their newborns. There have been studies that have shown that that skin-to-skin -skin contact, especially in these premature babies, decreases the risk of development of infection, of kidney issues, of lung issues. It goes a long way. And cutting those cords would have one very practical advantage. Changing a diaper will be easier without all the cords. While final testing is completed, babies in the study wore both the new patches and the old wires as a backup. Doctors say it will be about two years before these sensors are in regular use. And I got to tell you, I know just how great it would be to have them because my son Noah was born at 31 weeks, three pounds, six ounces. Aww. He was in the neonatal ICU for about three weeks. and But it ended very well because uh, he is there almost is. 23 pounds. A little bigger now. So anyway, that's what, what's going on. Like I said, uh, that was a probably three and a half year effort. It was published about this time last year. And I just want to point out, um, you know, the, the co-authors, I mean, it, it, to do something like this really requires an inter interdisciplinary collection of folks, not only on the engineering science side, but on the medical science side as well. And so some of the co-authors are from dermatology, neonatology, pediatrics. I found that uh, nurses are probably the most important people here because they know what, what the real challenges are. And if they're not uh, bought into the technology, you know, you're not going anywhere. So, so this was a, a great uh, sort of team effort. But, but the goal is, and, and this is a picture of the team. There's Amy Pollard, she's head of dermatology. There's Aaron Hombas, head of neonatology. Uh, Debbie Weissmeyer, head of uh, autonomic uh, medicine. A couple of nurses over here. Uh, engineering team and so on. It was, a, it was a great team effort. But the goal is not to publish a paper, but to generate something meaningful. And uh, 
we were able to get uh, a large grant from the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and the Save the Children Foundation to deploy these devices into uh, the developing world where there's really no monitoring technology at all. And it turns out the cost structure associated with these platforms is very attractive because the data streams can go straight to a cell phone. Everybody has a cell phone. So, so you eliminate a lot of the costs associated with traditional monitoring technology. So we're in the middle of a 10,000 unit deployment. Uh, that's going into a India, Pakistan, Zambia, Kenya, and Ghana. We're already in Zambia, Kenya, and Ghana. It started in October, but this deployment will extend through uh, the end of this uh, calendar uh, calendar year. And in order to make this happen, we actually had to adapt and refine the engineering platforms. And those were just published two weeks ago in uh, Nature Medicine. So if you want to check out the latest and greatest uh, devices, the ones that are actually deployed in Africa, uh, you can see them there. So I spent a week myself in Zambia in uh, December. Unfortunately, the bylaws associated with these foundations don't allow me to show pictures of the devices uh, deployed in those countries. Uh, but it's very exciting and, and very emotionally moving to, to see those, those kinds of um, highly resource constrained uh, regions of the globe and, and the struggles that they have with basic uh, health care. And uh, you know, we're, we're uh, excited to be able to make uh, some level of contribution there. So a year ago is the paper at this point, it's not just uh, Africa, we're deployed globally through a number of different partnerships, not just Gates and Save the Children, but Anthem and Janssen and Drager as well. So I think we're in 15 countries now and uh, these, these deployments are uh, accelerating. So let me um, talk a little bit about how these platforms can be used with other patient populations. We're very uh, interested in maternal, fetal, neonatal, and pediatric health. I think that's a real sweet spot for these technologies. And some of the Gates deployments involve maternal and fetal as well. I didn't mention that. But we, we have a lot of activities in that, that area. But we also work kind of at the uh, end of life, uh, you know, in terms of the, the arc of, of patients that, that come through, you know, hospitals. And, and in, particular, in particular, we work with uh, folks at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab on stroke survivors. And there they were interested in tracking speech and swallowing uh, in these uh, patients. And so those throat mounted devices turn out to have a high level of relevance here because uh, they can capture mechanic signatures of speech and also swallowing. And a lot of the rehab that goes on with these patients uh, really focuses on teaching them and uh, you know, having them relearn how to speak uh, and how to swallow. And, and having a monitoring technology that can provide information in that context turns out to be very important in personalizing the rehabilitation. What's, what's the key, so uh, these are not the micro so they're capturing the general body frequency and you can just watch and watch like college football Packers the Packers of what's called aphasia and dysphagia but if you think about that monitoring location in particular uh, the suprasternal notch it's a very information rich part of the body when you think about mechanics based measurements of physiological processes. So this, these devices are totally sealed. They involve a very high bandwidth, very high sensitivity triaxis accelerometer. So you're just measuring motions right there, but you're capturing speech, as I mentioned before, swallowing, you're close enough to the carotid artery, you can pick up signatures of pulsatile blood flow so you can get heart rate, heart rate variability. You're coupled to the chest wall cavity here and so you can pick up respiratory rate, but you're also capturing respiratory sounds, uh, coughing, wheezing, sneezing, that, that kind of thing. Because the uh, bandwidth extends to uh, frequencies very, very near DC, you can also monitor body orientation and steps and gait. And so I think this, this becomes a very special location uh, on the body for, for monitoring from, from the standpoint of thinking of the body as a mechanical uh, system. And so this is what data looks like. So these are the three axes as a function of time during different activities. So you can see the respiration here, holding the breath there. This little fuzzy stuff, that's actually a cardiac activity. So there's the lub dub of each cardiac cycle. You can see that uh, directly. Here's talking. You see these high frequency signals. Uh, they're swallowing. It almost looks like a, a, a delta function on this uh, time scale. Very distinct and different from heart activity or, or talking vocalization. You can see walking and jumping and moving. So the question is, how do you do classif classification of these different features so you can pull out all of this information from a single time series uh, data. And it turns out you can do that by looking at the temporal behavior, but also the spectral characteristics. And you can put together a collection of, of uh, digital uh, signal 
filtering algorithms to, to do sort of multimodal information extraction from, from these kinds of uh, data streams. And I won't get, get into the details, it gets uh, fairly elaborate, but, but it turns out that, that you can do that. So you can measure uh, overall energy expenditure, heart rate, respiration rate, swallow count, and talk time uh, simultaneously from that rich data being collected uh, from a single device on a single location of the body. Here's what it looks like in the context of swallowing. So here you see these, uh, this is the raw signal, these cycles that corresponds to respiration. Uh, there the breath is being held uh, for a certain period. What looks like noise is actually cardiac activity. So if you take this thing and you eliminate the low frequency contact content, you're left with the cardiac activity. So you get heart rate, heart rate variability. You subtract out the cardiac, you're left with just the respiration. And then you can very clearly see these uh, swallow features. There's a swallow, a swallow, a swallow. And it turns out that uh, in rehab, you have to teach these stroke survivors how and when to swallow. You have to swallow at a particular phase point in the respiratory cycle, otherwise you'll choke uh, and you'll choke uh, to death potentially. So, so it's very, very important to be able to measure this, not only when the swallows are happening, how frequently they're happening, but when they're occurring relative to the respiration cycle. And this device provides all of that at a very high level of data, uh, data quality. So you can get heart rate and respiration rate, and we've done all the comparisons to gold standards. That works very well. Uh, and we can uh, do further validation uh, in sleep labs. So we can track heart rate and respiration rate. We can benchmark against polysomnography systems, wired-based systems. This is one of the graduate students working on the project. You can see the device on the suprasternal notch there, soft mechanics, wireless operation as an alternative to, to all of this uh, kind of stuff. But let me spend the last uh, 10 minutes uh, that I have on um, what we're doing in, in, in the context of the, uh, of the pandemic. So about two weeks ago, we were contacted by uh, physicians, nurses, rehabilitation specialists at the Shirley Ryan Ability Lab uh, because they are aware of our work through, through our collaborations there on stroke survivors. And they asked us if we could adapt our suprasternal notch device, which we just published a couple months ago in February in Nature Biomedical Engineering, whether we could adapt that device for tracking coughing, coughing intensity, coughing frequency. Could we add a temperature sensing capability on top of the heart rate and the respiratory sounds and the respiration rate uh, type of functionality that we had already demonstrated? And so this occurred to us as a compelling opportunity to try to, try to contribute uh, to a clear need. And so we went off and uh, added all the functionality. So we had to develop new algorithms for doing cough detection. I'll talk about that in a second. We had an unused temperature sensor sitting in this platform, but we had the right software to allow us to extract that information then wirelessly stream it. So within six days, we pulled together a small team of uh, students and postdocs in the group and put that together uh, and made that happen. So why cough and why temperature? Well, it turns out that the physicians know, know what they're talking about. This is a paper that just published in the Journal of American Medical Association just last week. And if you look at the conditions uh, that are associated, the, the syndromes, the, the symptoms of COVID-19, they're dominated by fever and cough. If you can measure fever, cough, and respiratory activity, shortness of breath, you've captured the vast majority of COVID patients. That's not tailored and specific to COVID, but these are the kinds of physiological signatures that you need to be able to measure. And you cannot do that from the wrist. You can't do it from a ring. I think this suprasternal notch location is very uniquely well suited to measuring these uh, parameters. And so this, this is what we uh, set out to do. I don't know how many people have been watching these coronavirus task force briefings uh, every day, but they're fascinating. This is a, a clip from a briefing uh, given by Deborah Burks on uh, the 16th. And this is data from uh, New Orleans. So they have an influenza network uh, in, uh, you know, in place across the, the country here in the US. And that network basically monitors admissions of patients into emergency rooms who are showing symptoms consistent, uh, consistent with influenza-like um, like disease. Uh, and they track this all the time. And this is what it looks like in uh, New Orleans as a function of time. So there was a strong peak toward late March uh, and then a tailing away. And plotted on this same graph uh, corresponds to uh, the COVID outbreak. And you see that happening uh, in a time lag fashion relative to this influenza breakout. And so the question is, is there a relationship here? Are there COVID patients built into this curve that, that weren't initially recognized as, as uh, COVID uh, uh, disease stricken uh, individuals? And could this kind of peak be used as an early warning sign, a syndromic pattern for, for uh, a corona 
uh, virus outbreak. And then the next question from the standpoint of medical uh, monitoring technology is it's why do you have to wait until somebody is admitted to the emergency room? Why can't you pick that up earlier? Like if you're monitoring at-risk individuals, you might be able to pick it up while they're still in the home and the condition hasn't uh, evolved to a level of severity that causes them to go to the hospital. And so that's the whole value proposition here is to try to push this early warning curve out in time so that you can react and get in, get in front of these uh, hot spots and, and outbreaks. That, that's the whole idea. So from the standpoint of the engineering, you gotta be able to co uh, count coughs. You gotta be able to uh, monitor their intensity. So we did a lot of um, testing just internally uh, on students and, and sort of induced coughing events and overlaid speech and all kinds of other uh, activities. And it turns out the spectral characteristics of cough are much different than speech. So speech, you see very well-defined harmonics in the spectrogram. This is a cough event. Uh, it's very broadband and it's very short. And you can use that temporal and spectral characteristic to separate cough from essentially everything else. It go, goes away very, very nicely. So you can remove talking using digital fil uh, filtering approaches, leaving just cough. And then you can just count cough. And in this case, we have labeled data. So we know when the coughs are actually happening. And so we do a pretty good job. About 80% of the coughs are captured. We do a little bit of overcounting, but, but not too bad. And I think the overcount corresponds to clearing of the throat. So it's difficult for us to distinguish clearing of the throat from coughing, but both are probably important in the context of uh, uh, the application that we're pursuing. So you can do this all day long. You can monitor cough, uh, coughs uh, and you can track the count. You know exactly when they're happening. You can accumulate that, accumulate that over time. Physicians can look at it day by day to determine whether an individual is coughing more or less uh, over a course of time. Uh, and you can also track at the same time heart rate, respiratory activity, and temperature as well. So this is what it looks like collected in the home, COVID patient in the home setting, self-isolating in this case. Here's what their cough counts look like as a function of time and then cumulate a cumulative number of cough counts as you move through. Here's heart rate. You can actually see um, uh, sort of circadian rhythms here. This is nighttime. The heart rate goes down, goes back up, goes down, goes back up. These are not uh, noisy uh, features. That's actual spiking in, in the heart rate. And you can see that uh, decay very rapidly. This is uh, temperature. Uh, and this is activity uh, over the course of the day. So we're able to put together a HIPAA compliant cloud so that the data goes straight from the patient to an iPad up to the cloud. All the algorithms happen uh, automatically and we have a, a graphical user interface set up for physicians. So they select the patient, there's a pull down menu here, they select the date and time and boom, all the graphical information comes up. It's shown right on this web uh, interface uh, as, as a remote uh, monitoring. Uh, capability. So this is what it looks like. We have to build all these things in-house. These are 3D printed cases for the chargers. We're building these uh, devices here in the lab. We pair them with an iPad. So it's a pair of devices per charger, one device per uh, iPad. And this is the most recent delivery just yesterday at Northwestern uh, Memorial. So we're in Shirley Ryan Ability Lab, but also Northwestern Memor uh, Memorial now on actual COVID patients, as well as physicians, nurses, and rehabilitation specialists who are treating COVID patients. So the idea there is to pick up early symptoms for the patients. We're trying to track their progression through, through the disease and their responsiveness to various uh, therapies that are being uh, that are being tested. So this is what the full system looks like. Data collection can happen continuously. You mount it, it's there all, all day long. You can take a shower, you can do a workout. It's not a problem, it's like a Band-Aid. You don't even feel that it's there. When you pull it off and you put it on the charger, it automatically starts to download. So the patients, the physicians, nurses don't have to do anything. We just take the device off, drop it on the charger, automatically downloads the data to, to an iPad through a Bluetooth link. And then as soon as the download is done, Wi-Fi link of data from the iPad to the cloud. And it's a HIPAA compliant cloud, all, all IRB approved, automated algorithms and physician uh, friendly GUI and interface for uh, data science as well. So the algorithm developers can go and download the raw data from, from the web interface and, and the physicians are just presented with the, uh, the graphical output of, of the algorithms applied to, to that data. So we're still early in this, it's only one and a half weeks since we started deployment, but we've been on 25 subjects, again, patients, nurses, uh, and physicians, both in the hospital and at home, tracking them continuously. We have about 1,200 hours of data and approaching a half, half a terabyte of data, uh, and, and, and this is, uh, this is going, going quite well. 
So I think I'm basically out of time and I don't want to pu push the limits here. I know it can be exhausting listening to uh, sort, of, sort of a Zoom uh, lecture. And I think the, the 3D interfaces, the organoids is going to go beyond the, the time slot here. So, so I'm just going to skip this con content. If um, you know, pe people are interested, I'd be happy to kind of go, go, go through that maybe, maybe at a different time. I just want to go to the um, acknowledgements uh, slide and um, uh, just recognize all of the really outstanding senior collaborators that have been working with with us in this uh, area, most prominently uh, Yang Gong uh, Huang, but John Fine and Arun Jaramayan, uh, Yi Hui uh, Zong on, on mechanics and 3D, Amy, Steve, Aaron, Colin, Debbie, Molly, Ankit, and uh, Fizan uh, Abdullah across uh, NICU, PICU, uh, and uh, COVID-19. But the most important folks are the students and the postdocs who do, who do the work. Uh, and they really stepped up, uh, you know, on this uh, COVID opportunity. They understand they're not working on a paper necessarily, but but they're doing things that that might have broader uh, value uh, in in the immediate term. But but also uh, think thinking about how how to handle future uh, pandemics and potential outbreaks as we move in into the end of the year and, and, and into the fall. So I want to acknowledge, acknowledge them as well, uh, and just conclude by uh, you know really highlighting the interdisciplinary nature of uh, what, what we're trying to do in, in uh, merging sort of engineering with, with medicine and trying to address uh, important problems. So, so with that, I'm, I think I'm gonna quit, uh, Jimmy, and, and stop there and uh, thank everybody for their uh, attention. Thank you very much, John. This is uh, truly exciting, very interesting. We have uh, uh, results even from yesterday. Uh, you know, uh, April 21st results. So, uh, okay, so we will have some time for questions and uh, answers. Uh, what we can do is, uh, okay, uh, John, can you get out of, or oh, maybe just oh, you sure, stay yeah. there first? Jigang. Uh, Teach yeah. me how to, so, how to allow people to ask questions. Well, our, here are some uh, uh, familiar faces. So let, let's uh, have them turn on their, their <laughs> right. So maybe Videos. you can start with the panelists. OK, so the panelists can actually raise their hands directly. I can see you. Tom? Uh, I'm muted, I was so. muted. Uh, John, thank you once again uh, for a great uh, seminar and uh, uh, well, actually we call it the EM, EML webinar um, on the latest, very latest research, especially the COVID related uh, research. Um, I have a question uh, in general uh, on your experience working with the physicians and also with the nurses, uh, you have the <coughs> one slide showing uh, you have this uh, science paper with 45 co-authors. Many of them are physicians and also nurses. Mm -hmm. I recall uh, quite some years ago, I was in a... Um, uh, so this is... Uh, okay. Um, so quite some years ago, I was in a, uh, a, a real seminar given by uh, Robert Langer at MIT. Uh, he was sharing his experience uh, with uh, um, uh, uh, the physicians uh, in the earlier years. It's not that straightforward and not that smooth. And uh, it takes quite some uh, effort for him to get the uh, physicians uh, interested in the, and they evolved uh, eventually into collaborative research and also deliver something very meaningful. Uh, can you uh, share some tips, experience of your research uh, um, in collaboration with the physicians uh, with great success with deployment, the thousands of deployments around the world and also in this current COVID-19 uh, uh, situation? Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question. I, I mean, I would start by um, just acknowledging that, that Bob Langer probably sets the standard for this sort of thing. We're nowhere near that that type of level, but but at the same time, I think we've had some um, 
you know, some no notable successes. We'll see how it evolves over time, but but I think we're on a good good track. Um, so so um, you know we're optimistic about it. But I, I would say um, to start with, um, I, I I would point out that um, physicians are very problem oriented, you know, and and they they um, live in a very problem rich environment. And in that sense, I think they have a, a similar worldview to to um, to that of uh, of an engineer in in a sense, right? So so you know, uh, in, engineers also like to solve problems. So so I think there's a a resonance and, and a basic alignment, you know, between clinical professionals, nurses as well, and um, and people who are interested in engineering science, you know, from from an academic standpoint, uh, at least those those of whom you know are are thinking about uh, solutions and and challenges and, and problems and, and new ideas. So, so I think that's the good news uh, is that, you know, there, there's a great alignment and synergy uh, at that level, but, but the language is totally different. I think the, um, um, the, the physicians are, um, I would say overall impatient, you know, they, they don't have, uh, at least most of the ones that we, we interact with, they, they don't have a ton of time to, to mess around with stuff that's not really working. And so, so you have to be prepared to, um, you know, operate all the way to the, to the system level. You know, I, I think they're used to like unpackaging a, a commercial device, plugging it in and then, you know, using it, you know? And so, so I, I think they, they have to be educated around what, a brand new technology looks like, and and uh, oriented to the fact that uh, you know there there will be problems, and that they can be involved in the solution. So so I think um, the the best uh, engagements that we've had have been with uh, physicians who are interested in working directly with us on you know certain aspects of the engineering. They're not going to con contribute kind of at a at a deep level, but but contribute ideas and, and share uh, opinions on what works and what doesn't. So it's more of a, an interactive type, type of engagement as, as opposed to us trying to show up and, and deliver something that's, uh, you know, in, in a final form, you know, in, in that sense. So, so I, I would say that a couple of other thoughts is that, um, you know, you, you really have to be operating at the, at the full system. I mentioned the software interface, like we didn't really want to do the software, you know, we're not a software group and, and at some level, you know, graphical user interface design. I mean, it's kind of a commodity at, at some level. It's not really academic research in any way, but like, like if you're not doing that, then, then you can't make progress. So, so you have to be from, from the standpoint of the engineer, you really have to be uh, willing to like go, go a little bit outside of your core expertise and, and do things that might not, themselves be publishable, let's say, from the standpoint of an academic, but which are absolutely essential if you if you want to kind of take take the next step. So so we had to do that. I mean, I think at some point, you know, it needs to get handed off, um, you know, to to a more commercially oriented uh, entity. But but for brand new technologies and, and especially for a market like neonatal care, it's not a multi-billion dollar market. There aren't VCs flooding investments into development of new technologies. But I think for that, that patient population, but I think there's tremendous societal need and, and value in working uh, on, on that. And so, you know, you really have to be prepared as an academic to, to push things, like I said, to, to a very high level of uh, engineering refinement um, in, in order to engage. You can't show up with a sensor, you know, it's just not you're not going to get anywhere. You know, you have to have the sensor and the back end and the wireless and the algorithms to go go with that, so that it doesn't need to be product ready, but it has to be deployable. I guess at, at some level, that that that's been our experience. And and once you're in that realm, then it's it, there's no problem get, getting engagement. I mean, I I get all kinds of unsolicited inquiries from from physicians downtown. Chicago all the time. I mean, I have to turn people away. I mean, there's no, absolutely no shortage of eager, willing collaborators in, in the clinical environment. You just have to be ready to, to engage kind of on their terms, you know, if, if you, want it, uh, you want it to work. John, Thank you for promote, sharing the insight. Yeah. Okay, uh, John, let me promote the, one of the questions from the uh, question and answer box over there. This is from uh, Mahabubu. Raman, uh, he asked, are these sensors reusable? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think especially in the context of uh, COVID-19, 
you know, sterilization is, is crucial. And I'll start there and then talk about the neonatal stuff. So the, the beauty of making a mechanics measurement is you don't need an electrode interface. You don't need an optical interface. You just need a mechanical interface. So, so the devices are completely sealed. I think if they weren't completely sealed, we wouldn't be in the hospital right now, you know, because of the extreme high level of contagion, right? Uh, and you have to be able to do sterilization at the highest levels. If you have any gaps or seams or uh, relief structures where, you know, um, particulates and viruses could, could, could reside, then, um, then it's no go. It's, it's just too, too dangerous. You don't want your device to be the vector for transmitting the disease, you know, across the hospital. It would be like an absolute disaster. Right. So, right. so I think the, the only reason why there was a conversation in the first place is, is the fact that it's a mechanics oriented measurement. The devices are completely sealed, no seams, no data ports. It's all wirelessly controlled, it's wirelessly charged. Uh, there's no, you know, charging uh, receptacle or plug or any, anything else. So, so we, we can do full immersion uh, sterilization in uh, ethanol, and then we follow that with a, a gas phase sterilization process based on ethylene oxide. So we have a sterilization unit downtown. So they're very, very well sterilized, and uh, as a result, they're reusable. You know, it's a, it's a rechargeable battery, and, um, and, and that's, that's the way that it works. I would say you know, into the future, you could imagine them as single use uh, because the cost structure associated with care of these types of patients is such that, you know, the incremental costs associated with sensors, nothing, you could throw them away. But we are not a company. We, we're not mass manufacturing these devices. So if our collaborators are throwing a device, our, our devices away every time they're used, there's no way we could keep up, you know, and, and, and the, the scale of the deployment would be very, very limited. So, so the reuse is important, I would say, for immediate term uh, opportunities into the future, you might think of them as uh, single use. I mean, I mean, the economics would, would allow for that, but let's put it that way. And that's probably the way that they, they would ultimately be, uh, be used, but, but we can't do that uh, right, right now. So that, that's, that's a set of comments for the, for the COVID-19 and the supersternal notch uh, devices. For, for the neonates, uh, there, there's a similar consideration that applies to uh, the developing world. So, so they, they, they really have to be uh, reusable. You, you can't get the uh, economics in, into a sustainable uh, regime for uh, developing countries to, to access this technology if, if the, the monitoring devices are not reusable. And so, so the Nature Medicine paper that we uh, published was really all about the engineering of, of how to build reusable devices and how to add sort of advanced functionality as well into the platforms because the devices that we published in, in the science paper last year, it's difficult to reuse them because they're fragile. They're fragile at some level. I mean, they're skin-like literally in, in their mechanics. And so if they're super careful, you can peel them off and, and you won't damage them. But the, the nurses are typically like pretty, pretty aggressive and, and pretty, um, you know, um, uh, you know, uh, you know, I, I would say they're 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 quick with their motions and, and the way that they handle things. So so they don't hold up, you know, for for many cycles uh, of use. And so so for um, you know a level four NICU like the one at Lurie Children's, the cost is not an issue uh, even for single use of of the science type uh, devices because the um, the electrode leads and the wired based systems that they're using are single use already. And so if you look at the cost stack up, our, our electronics are not very much more expensive than the uh, than the gel-based electrode and the, and the wired uh, leads. And so it really, really wouldn't change the econo economics at all for them to be sing single use. Okay, I, I see Benjamin T, your mic is unmuted. Uh, do you have a question? Yeah, hi, hi, uh, hi, John, uh, great to see you. Uh, and uh, I think this has been the highlight of my uh, time in work from home this month. Uh, you know, thank you for the excellent, excellent talk. Um, so uh, I had, my question is, well, I have two questions. If you so one of the things I'm very, uh, I really like the idea of these ultra thin films, and as the more I think about it, you know, there is a counter um, property that actually uh, may be impacted, which is the charge density, right? As you thin them down, the charge density is higher. So, do you see, you know, in terms of what your applications, especially related to tissues, whether that would be a problem because resistance would go up? Uh, and, and this could maybe lead to electromigration issues if you're operating at higher uh, voltage. And the other, the sort of general question is, you know, as a young faculty, also interested in entrepreneurship and starting companies, 
uh, you've been a huge role model for me. Uh, what would be your number one advice to many others uh, that are interested to create impactful companies like what you've done? Thank you. Yeah, okay. Two, two great questions. Uh, I'm sort of sad to hear that this was the highlight of your month at home. You, you must have a very sad home. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> I, I feel bad for you in that sense. But um, yeah, so, so the charge density and electro migration, I guess you'd have to think about that. Um, you know, these are not high power devices for the, for the most part. And so there's not a lot of current density. There's not a lot of thermal load. Um, I think electro migration might be more relevant for a very high clock rate, you know, microprocessor, for example. But for these devices, you, you don't really need that and, and you don't really have the option for it either. Otherwise, you end up with a, a, a battery that's totally dominating, you know, the form factor. So, so I think the name of the game in, in these platforms is uh, ultra power efficient designs and computationally efficient analytics to the extent that you need to do that on, on the patch itself. And so I think you're solving, I guess, two problems at once. You're solving battery life and you're also solving some of these electro migration and current density effects that you just mentioned. And um, that that's kind of um, guiding a lot of the, the, the choices of, of components and, and the, way, the way that the devices are operating uh, as well. And all the heavy computational load is happening off off the device. So you do a little bit of data aggregation, maybe feature extraction on the patch to minimize the amount of uh, wireless data streaming you need to do because that's also a power hog. But beyond that, all of the um, you know, machine learning and the digital filtering and all that kind of stuff is happening in the cloud uh, or uh, in, in, in a portable device that's wirelessly interfaced to the, to the sensor. So I think it's a great question, but at least for the applications that we're looking at, it, it's not like uh, a dominating practical consideration. It, it may be in certain scenarios or certain applications or certain device architectures, but we haven't had to, to worry about it much. So, so that, that, that's a set of thoughts. Um, your, your second question had to do with uh, startups. So I guess um, this could be a long conversation, but I think in the early days, we, we uh, would, would do startups in, in the conventional way. Um, you, know, you write a business plan, you put together a pitch deck, you talk to VCs, you get them to invest some money, you do a series A, um, you know, a few million bucks, you hire some people, you get a CEO, you develop a business strategy, you do the technology and you kind of do that. And then you do a series B and you do a series C and you go, go on like that. Um, I think it can be a, a good mechanism. I think probably we and probably the broader community as well is thinking these days about startups in a, in a much different uh, mode. So, so we like bootstrap, you know, and um, uh, starting companies without any investors, you know, at, at all, you know, if, if you can do that. And I think the primary benefit of that is that you can um, keep the entity focused on engineering and, and keep a lot of the business distractions um, suppressed to a certain extent. You have to worry about it, right? But but you, you can focus on the engineering innovation, you can focus on product deployment and, um, uh, and, and revenue generation through sales, as opposed to um, you know, the orientation that uh, at least I've experienced is, is that with VCs, they're, they're looking for an exit at, at the soonest uh, possible opportunity to get a return on their investment. And so there, the emphasis tends to be a little bit more around storytelling and uh, pitch decks to, to potential acquirers or um, if you're go going public then then doing the road show. So I, I wouldn't say I've had bad experiences with that necessarily, but, but we and I uh, specifically find it much more enjoyable, much more rewarding and maybe much more efficient and effective to, to do the, the bootstrapped mode. So for the, for the neonatal um, intensive care unit monitoring devices, it probably would have been hard to raise VC capital around uh, that application. Uh, in spite of its importance from a societal standpoint, if just run the numbers, it's not huge, you know, and, and it's not a multi-billion dollar market, but it's what we want to do. And um, with the Gates Foundation and the Save the Children Foundation, we can fund the operation using non-dilutive um, funding. Uh, streams, you know, from, from those two entities. And, and uh, we, we've been able to, to do that. And um, 
we've been able to layer on top of that, you know, uh, joint development programs, again, non-diluted. These are not investments, but it's, uh, you know, significant uh, amounts of cash financial resources allow us to build a team and put together a light manufacturing facility and uh, rent a place. So we have, as I mentioned before, a partnership with a medical insurance company, Anthem. Uh, they're interested in at-home monitoring for, uh, you know, ways to sort of reduce premiums and do, do triage on, on their customer base. And, you uh, uh, Janssen Pharmaceutical, that's a, a division of Johnson & Johnson. They're doing pediatric monitoring in the context of a, a, a pharmaceutical trial that they're doing on a, on a new uh, drug. And so being able to monitor the home to determine, based on quantitative metrics, the effects of those, those uh, drugs on, on their patients, that's very important to them. And so we get a large non-dilutive funding stream from them. And then we just signed a, um, uh, a deal with Draeger. So, so they make medical monitoring technologies and isolates that are used in the NICU. Uh, and so that's our channel into hospitals. We'd never be able to do that without a partner. So the point is, I guess, you can pull these things together and um, we're, we're just responding for the most part these days to inbound interest. So, so if we're doing something, we publish a paper, there's some kind of public awareness of that. If there's somebody out there at a large company that wants to pursue commercialization, they'll call me up or send me an email and then we'll have that conversation. If it makes sense, then that becomes a nucleating event for starting a company. And you don't pitch VCs, you basically wait for commercial interest to happen and then uh, and then launch on that basis. Otherwise, keep keep it in the academic lab and and move it forward sort, sort of in, in that way. So. So that we've done a few companies in that in that mode, keeping the burn rate really really low, and uh, and and using this kind of non dilutive approach, and the the focus really really um, you you retain focus on on the engineering and, and the product development without any distraction. And the other consequence is you own the thing, you you control it. You don't have a big board with all kinds of people who aren't really committed to the business, you know, providing opinions and everything. You have to vote on everything and. It's just cumbersome, you know. And uh, if you're doing it bootstrapped and you own the whole thing, you just make the decisions on the fly based on your own judgment. And and I, for me, that's a lot more satisfying. Uh, and I think it's just a better better way to do things. But, you know, um, yeah. In, anyway, I, I won't go on uh, any any okay, longer. Thank you so much. Thank you, for, thank you for answer. Fantastic. Thanks. Yeah. Uh, I did it. Yeah. Oh, uh, that okay. was. Yeah. Uh, uh, no, let, let us know where you're from and uh, which institution. Okay. Yeah, I'm a postdoc uh, in the Mahadevan lab at Harvard. Mm -hmm. And uh, that was a great talk. I had a question about the adhesion uh, between this uh, material that you're using for the electronic, like, you know, the devices. And there is a lot of variability from patient to patient in terms of like, you know, what the skin type is and then like, you know, if there's sweat, if there's oil secretion, how long the device can stay adhered? And do you, are you doing anything special to the material in order to enhance those capabilities or long, like, you know, enhancing the long, uh, length of the viability? Yeah. Yeah, that's a great question. So for the, the neonates, there's not a lot of uh, sweating. Uh, they're in a pretty well-controlled in, environment. And, and there are not a lot of sort of mechanical forces being, being imparted at the interface. So you can get away with a pretty simple, pretty light uh, adhesive. We use uh, hydrogels that are already FDA approved uh, for, for use on neonates. It just de-risks things and it keeps our technology separated from the skin <laughs> because you don't, have to, you don't have to worry about skin reactions and so on. So I know Ji Gong and uh, David Mooney and others at Harvard have done some fantastic work on uh, advanced hydrogels. We're, we're using kind of commercial uh, gels for for that purpose seems seems to work fine, um, but but it's it, it's interesting that you ask about that because um, you know you can use Jello as a, as an adhesive. It turns out so like especially with um, resource constrained environments, we're looking at foodstuffs. This is kind of like crazy research you know oriented. But if you can eliminate the hydrogel, you eliminate a little bit of the uh, you know materials cost, and it's important you know in these resource constrained areas. So you can use um, there's certain type of potato that they grow in Zambia. You basically mush it up and you can actually collect ECG signal with that. So, so I think there are a lot of like really interesting things you can do uh, you know, in the material science aspects of uh, skin adhesives and, and hydrogels. 
the caveat there is it's a very old field, you know, and there's a huge range of commercially available products and FDA approval and all kinds of things. So you have to kind of find a sweet spot and, and look for opportunities that haven't been fully mined out, you know, based on uh, work in, in the skin bandage space, you know, over the last 50, 100 years. So, so that, that's, uh, you know, a couple of comments. The, um, the moisture, so, so back to COVID patients, this is a big, big deal, actually, because, um, you know, a lot of them are um, older um, patients, right? They're, they're older and their, their skin, you know, guys can kind of analogous to the neonate underdeveloped skin. It's kind of old skin, right? I'm, I'm, I almost have kind of old skin here. So it, it gets irritated, right? You, you apply a sticker, even a Band-Aid. You apply a Band-Aid, you remove a Band-Aid once a day or once every other day, and you keep doing that, you know, for a couple of weeks, you end up with redness, right? So thinking about ways to uh, innovate at that skin adhesive uh, level, level is interesting. We've been looking at... Uh, platforms that have uh, perforations, so holes uh, at different strategic locations across the device so that you can introduce water at the interface and it swells the hydrogel, the device just falls off. I think that's kind of uh, interesting and that, that seems to work uh, pretty well. The, the other thing that you can do is you can um, put, put a, a it's sort of um, interposer, I guess. It's um, like, like a Band-Aid, you put the Band-Aid on and then you adhere the device to that rather than the skin. And so when you peel the device off, that interposer stays put. So you're not peeling away from the skin on that 24 hour cycle, you're peeling away from the top surface of that interposer bandage. So, so that's helpful if the skin irritation is due to the mechanical peeling forces. But some cases uh, it can be associated with uh, trapped moisture and that that could be associated with just like vigorous sweating, but but it also can just be due to trapped transepidermal water loss or just naturally coming from the surface of the skin all the time, like insensible sweating. And there we found that fabric-based adhesives are really effective. So you design the adhesive, it's a little bit larger than the device itself, and just capillarity will wick the moisture out and allow it to evaporate around the perimeter. Uh, and that works really well. It's like a simple thing, but... Um, you know, it allows you to to eliminate that that type of effect. But but I think those are great questions, and maybe you know certain aspects uh, you know of skin adhesives haven't really been like fully you know um, lo looked at and innovated ar around right in terms of the broader community. So I don't know who's on the call. It's a good set of topics. You know, if you want to research uh, you know project, you would think about that skin interface. I think there's some interesting things that one could do. Nanshu, I, I see you raise your hands. <laughs> we cannot hear you. Uh, yeah. So okay. My yes. Phone. Okay. Right. So may I? So is that Alice? Oh. Hi, Alice. <laughs> Okay. Hi. Uh, yes. Hi, Rogers. I'm my Eric. Hi, John. Nice to see you again. Yeah. yeah. So very nice talk. I have a question. So is for the last example you show, you just ship out, you know. Yeah. Uh, during between, you have a charger. Yeah. The oh. charger is a major for the batteries, for the long-term stability. So, so the devices themselves have a, a rechargeable, wirelessly rechargeable lithium po uh, polymer battery. In, inside the, the device. And the charger uh, consists of a inter integrated circuit board and then there's a, a, a coil, RF coil. Uh, and so oh. you just put the device, I mean, it's pretty standard charger technology. You put the device on top and you get inductive okay. coupling, magnetic inductive coupling, it charges it. But the, the, the key is um, in this case, the physicians uh, who are treating COVID, I mean, they're very stressful situation. They're very busy. They are not gonna click through a, user interface on, on the iPad. That, that was totally out, outside of uh, the realm of possibility. So, so we had to design this sort of automated approach. When you put it on the charger, the device knows it's on the charger. It automatically, as I mentioned, uh, begins the uh, data download through a Bluetooth link to the iPad. And then the iPad, as soon as that's done, okay. it automatically goes to the cloud. So the physicians don't have to do anything. At the end of the day, they drop their device on the charger uh, and they go home, and when they're at home, they can pull up the, the web interface to the cloud, and they can see all of the, uh, all the data. They go through the graphs. Okay, I okay. see. Okay, yeah, thank you. 
uh, Sulin, you have a question. Hi, John, this is Sulin. Uh, uh, very inspire, inspiring. Uh, is for, uh, I very much enjoyed it. So I have in terms of materials. Um, we know that silicon uh, is intrinsically very stiff, very uh, brittle. Uh, you make it very thin, so it's structurally soft, and structurally flexible uh, to make its purpose. But we also know that a lot of people in nowadays studying the soft matters. And this soft matters has a lot of fascinating uh, properties. For instance, the Jigan is studying the hydrogels, right? Mm -hmm. um, what do you think in the future, this kind of soft matter can replace in uh, silicon uh, in flexible electronics? Or uh, is this a trend or not a trend? Well, um, still stick to the uh, silicon. Uh, yeah, maybe. I mean, I, we'll see what happens, right? I, um, I, I think um, a hybrid approach allows kind of a full optimization in a way that's not sort of dogmatic around whether it's a soft material or hard material. Forget about it. Like, what, what, what are you interested in in terms of the system level properties and the operational capabilities? And then you use those criteria to guide your selection of materials. I, I don't think there's a lot of value in trying just just for the sake of trying it to build every uh, you know all aspects of the device out of soft materials or hard materials like why not pick and choose right and um and think about you know mechanics and geometries in in, in ways that allow you to do that heterogeneous integration it just seems like a better way to me and um i think sometimes academics get a little bit too too narrowly focused on certain classes of, uh, of materials as opposed to problems you know so I, I, there's lots of great work happening out, out there, obviously, but I think this idea of flexible, of flexible hybrid electronics is probably going to be a winner. You know, I, I, I could be wrong on that, but uh, the ability to um, leverage everything that's happening in, in consumer electronics is very powerful. So I would say there's a strong benefit from maintaining some degree of synergy and alignment with that industry. You know, and if you walk away from that, you have to develop everything from the ground up. It's not just the materials, but like it's the fabs, right? How are you going to do it? You know, if you look at the uh, silicon industry, they're heading toward two nanometer channel lengths. It's like absolutely unbelievable, you know, and tens of billions of, of transistors. And if you can figure out how to leverage some aspect of that, I, I think, you know, it's just a tremendous motivator to, to think about how to do that. And, and soft materials will have a very important role to play. I, I think there's no question about that. And maybe at the level of encapsulation and structural materials, but maybe even more so at the level of, uh, you know, switching elements, multiplexing arrays, maybe a little bit of local amplification, biosensors, specifically uh, biochemical sensors, I think will uh, absolutely demand you know, soft uh, materials. But if you're talking about a microprocessor or high density memory or a radio, yeah, I don't know. It's hard hard to see how, how you would be able to beat silicon. And I, I would make the other, this other comment. So I think the way that we got started, and again, it was kind of building on Gigons and Seegerds and George's work and Buckling and John Hutchinson, a lot of really famous mechanicians. But, you know, the wavy stuff and the thin stuff, it's, it's very powerful and it's a part of what we do. But if we can get a tiny little chip, you know, that, that might not be so thin, maybe, maybe you grind it down to 25 microns in thickness, but if it's half a millimeter on a side and you're talking about a skin integrated device, like who cares? I mean, it's so small, right? It doesn't need to, as long as the whole system level can kind of do what you need it to do from a standpoint of the mechanics and the geometry, you can accommodate a tiny little chip. So, so e even, you know, um, you, you, you can use technologies, you know, you can even in almost their native form, provided that they're small enough, you know, there, there's that consideration uh, as well. So um, that's kind of been our view is, is to try to choose what works best and, and try to put it all together, you know, so, so you have, uh, you know, so, something that's addressing real sort of practical requirements as, as, as a, with one particular class of, of material. But it's a great question. I mean, it's a common question. And I, I would also say we spent a lot of time on polymer semiconductors and small molecules and carbon nanotubes, a little bit with graphene. So those are great topics, you know, and, and there should be people working on those 
classes of materials, great re research is coming out of it, but um, we've been able to do a lot with silicon. I mean, that, that's just yeah. the, the reality. Of it. Okay, we're going to take one more questions from the audience about this particular talk. Beyond that, what we're going to do is, uh, uh, you know, we're, we're, we're going to have a general platform for people to discuss things that you're that are interested to you. Uh, and uh, these are the things that uh, we're, we're having, let's say, a, a Gordon conference type of discussion uh, related to the topic, but not necessarily specific to the talk. The last uh, question we want to take is from Nan Su. Hopefully, this time you can we can hear you. Hello, Jimmy. Can you hear me? Yes. Thank you. Sorry, I had to uh, enable the privacy seating. Uh, hello, John. <laughs> <laughs> Great to see you here. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I am totally with Ben, actually. Um, we have been excited about your talk since last week. Okay. <laughs> All right. <laughs> and uh, thanks for sharing your uh, very latest research. And I'm also glad to see Hyo Yang is doing great work in your lab. It is uh, yeah. Yeah, he's great. <laughs> really he's fantastic. nice yeah. to know. Um, yeah. So my question is actually something I got asked a lot uh, in my talks, and I, I've never uh, got a good answer to that. So um, the question is about the uh, uh, skin of uh, variation um, because we know uh, due to age and um, um, BMI and uh, skin color. So there are a lot of variation um, in the skin condition. So when we do those uh, epidermal measurements, um, how can we overcome those kind of uh, variation, especially like in impedance variation or like a light uh, penetration variation um, how do we unify those kind of uh, differences? Yeah, that, that's a good, good question. It's certainly something that's come up in the context of our deployments in Africa, for instance, and in South America. I mean, the skin variations are you know, prominent there, obviously. But um, you know, I, I guess it depends on what type of measurement you're making, right? So I think the specific skin impedance value, it doesn't really matter very much for ECG or EMG or uh, EEG. You're really just looking at the time dependence as opposed to the amplitude. Um, for a hydration measurement, you can do that with, a, with an impedance type uh, measurement and their you know, skin type uh, perhaps matters. We like a kind of a thermal approach and, and it eliminates you know, some, some of those type of effects. I guess maybe you're thinking about PPG or so, but, but there you're measuring the ratio of uh, you know, red to IR. So if there, there's a, a broad absorption band in, in the background and it's not time dependent, then, then I think that naturally gets subtracted out uh, as a result. Um, for, you know, pressure type measurements like arterial tonometry, or you're measuring flow or pulse little dy dynamics. Again, it's more of a, a time dependent measurement rather than amplitude dependent measurement. And so we have to measure flow through uh, shunts used in a hydrocephalus patients. So in a lot of these cases, you know, the, the skin becomes uh, an important intermediary for making a measurement, but the detailed skin properties themselves uh, don't don't matter as much because because you're interested in kind of underlying processes and uh, and looking at time dependent characteristics and ratio metric ratio metric uh, approaches kind of allow you to to factor out the skin properties to to a large degree. Um, but but just thinking more about the question, I mean BMI does have a strong impact on your ability, to, let's say, to measure. Um, you know, deflections at the skin surface associated with blood, pulse little blood flow through a deep artery. That, that would be an example, but there it's affecting the amplitude as, you know, if you can pick it up, even the amplitude is very small, it won't matter what, you know, how much fat is in between the surface of the skin and the underlying artery, because you're not trying to do anything with the amplitude, you're looking at the time dependence. So I don't know if that's kind of a repetitive answer or not, but is that kind of getting at the question or am I missing something? Uh, yes, that, that's super helpful. Now I have a good answer. Thank you. <laughs> okay. uh, James, I see you raised your hand. Uh, you have a question? James? Hello? Hello? Yeah. Yes, we can Hello, hear you. Hello, Professor John Roger. It's, uh, it's my pleasure to hear your speech. 
And this is my the best presentation I ever ever heard. I come from China, and my school is Nanjing University of Science and Technology. And my major is the solid mechanics. I want to ask um, right now. My research topic is the contact mechanics. I'm very interested in your uh, in your field. That uh, right now I'm doing the numerical simulation, and I want to know. How can I connect the uh, contact mechanics with your fire integrate uh, system? I mean, <laughs> yeah. Well, thank you for the kind comments. I mean, I guess um, in terms of contact mechanics, there may be things that you could do in the realm of adhesion. We were just talking about that a few few minutes ago. I think. Um, you know, adhesion forces at, at a skin surface are, are very important to a lot of these devices and um, sort of detailed quantitative measurements at the level of mechanics science. Maybe, you know, there, there's some opportunities there. The other thing is um, the mechanical properties of skin itself, like the, the stiffness of skin is many times used by uh, physicians to quickly diagnose, um, you know, uh, abnormalities in the skin for, for whether they're cancerous or not, mel melanomas, they tend to be stiffer than the surrounding skin and the way that physicians, uh, you know, test for that is just by touching the, the site with their fingers and they'll squeeze on it a little bit. So thinking about ways to do kind of in vivo, in situ, quantitative measurements of viscoelastic properties of the skin would be uh, pr pretty interesting. And we've thought about that. We've, we've published a couple of papers, but maybe not kind of, you know, fully satisfied with, with what we've been able to do. I mean, uh, in the sense that there are probably better ideas or better ways or be better measurement approaches, but that's something that we're working on, you know, right right now is, is ways to measure and map out the, the modulus of the skin using these kinds of skin interface devices. So I don't know if that, you know, research direction would kind of intersect with your expertise uh, or not, uh, probably, but, but, you know, there there are th things that are that are interesting in, in mechanical characterization. We also built a modulus sensor that mounts on the end of a catheter. So, in biopsies, when when they are trying to determine you know the the cancerous nature of tissues in inside the body, uh, they can use mechanical measurements as a way to guide the biopsy to the tissue that has a locally higher stiffness than the surrounding tissue, and then they can grab some part of that you know stiffened region of tissue, pull it out, and then evaluate whether it's a malignant or a benign uh, form of cancer. So the so mechanical um, measurements, and I guess quantitative uh, mechanical metrology is highly relevant, you know, not, not just at the mm -hmm. level of the skin, but in all kinds of biological systems. Yeah. And yeah. I see you really, unmuted you. yourself and uh, you've been patiently waiting for your turn. And? Really, really, thank you very much. Um, thank you for time. <laughs> Yeah, I, I had a, a question regarding, um, I think you have partly answered it, but do you think that everything can be, be structured, or at least you said so? I was wondering if you were to say that we are missing some sort of materials in, in the library, what, what would be that? What are the, the main missing uh, properties? Um, a couple of things, I guess. Um, what what for for implants like how do you, how do you pre prevent uh, tissue overgrowth and uh, immune responses and um, you know development of clots and and biofilm buildup you know what what kind of um, materials or surface chemical functionality could you um, introduce onto these platforms to to make them look like the surrounding biologies to 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 avoid any kind of uh, immune response that that's an uh, area that you know, it has a very long history associated with it. It's not specific to, to our types of devices, any type of implant, you have to worry about that. But I think it's largely an unsolved problem, you know, and uh, probably a very daunting problem as well. Uh, so, but that, but that is one area of, of need. I would say the broader uh, landscape of opportunities is in the realm of materials for biochemical sensors. So everything I talked about in this, Presentation—it's pretty simple stuff from from the standpoint of sensing. We're trying to do, you know, maybe a little bit unusual things or do do something in terms of data, you know, algorithmics, and so on. But we're not doing any of the really hard stuff. Like, you know, we don't have um, enzyme-specific sensors, you know, or 
you know, sensors that, that respond to particular types of hormones or neurotransmitters. And, um, you know, there, there's been a lot of work in, the, in that space, but, um, you know, I think in particular, you know, the use of aptamers as a uh, general generalizable approach to biochemical sensors, that, that's very exciting, like, like to me. If somebody could come up with something along those lines, I think it would really qualitatively expand the, the level of function in, in these platforms. And those kind of sensors would be highly kind of synergistic with the, um, with the biophysical sensors that may be a little bit more well-developed and, and may, maybe more thoroughly studied, you know, in terms of like practical application. But, but chemical sensing is where, where things really need to go. And, and I think it's gonna require new surface chemistries, new, new materials, new approaches. Uh, and, and there's pro probably a, a, a really, you know, um, fertile field, you know, uh, if, if you wanna think, think about a direction to go. Uh, I'm going to go to uh, Jacqueline, then they'll go to Chen Jiang afterwards. Uh, but uh, let me repeat that, uh, you know, you can bring in questions or ideas uh, even beyond just uh, this particular talk, but in the broad area of this field. Okay, Jacqueline. So, um, John, this is Jacqueline. Uh, I'm visiting scholar based in Cambridge, and uh, thank you for your very exciting sharing. Actually, we have a project uh, which actually is using the uh, air pollution uh, sensors uh, to monitor health and also a lot of wearable device. Mm -hmm. And we noticed that uh, your experience seems to show that you can scale up to, uh, your, 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 your work uh, to a lot of patients or subjects. Uh, so what is your experience? of like how to tackle a lot of uh, wearable devices and have you got this kind of like experience or wisdom how we can scale up the project given that you have a lot of data to handle the platforms to build up and then a lot of sensors and you have to incentivize your subjects to go through all these kind of things yeah great great question um i i would start by making a few comments so, so one is um you know, what I'm going to talk about in the next few minutes as a response to your question very much um, lies at the extreme sort of um, tail of the distribution of the things that are going on in my research group around okay. sort of commercialization. So we do a lot of exploratory stuff and, you know, playing around and, you know, kind of open-ended academic discovery. And that's what kind of the second part of the talk was, was oriented around these 3D interfaces to organoids. But to your question, you know, for... Um, for activities where, where we want to be able to deploy at a meaningful scale, where we have real clinical engagements, where we're worrying about software and analytics <laughs> and cloud and all that yeah. kind of stuff. Yeah. Um, you know, the, the question is, how do you get stuff out of the lab uh, at that yeah. level? And um, for those sets of activities within the broader scope of things we're doing in the group, we like to think about manufacturing at the beginning of the process. Mm -hmm. Not being overly constrained by manufacturing considerations, but if we're doing a sensor, we like to be able to um, envision how it would be scaled up. Otherwise, you end up kind of in a development pathway that, that uh, it, it puts you in an orphan situation that you uh -huh. can't connect back to kind of state-of-the-art ma manufacturing capabilities. Uh -huh. Because you can't deploy uh, devices, let's say, on a COVID patient or neonates or you know some of these other stroke survivors if each device is uniquely handcrafted by a grad student it's just it doesn't make any sense because you can't get any kind of a statistically meaningful yeah. data from from devices that are constructed in that way and then you also have to worry about risks to the patient right you know yeah. um, so so and I guess what what we've done and so I have a staff sort of manufacturing engineers really talented guy and he's embedded both with the students and the postdocs on one side and with external sort of manufacturing part partners that we have domestically here in the US and so they can do thousands of units not millions but they can do uh, prototyping for us and so on but but what what we've done recently is that uh, we've brought all the tooling in house so we are within my group we have manufacturing tools and um, that's going to be transformative and we had it's a result of a philanthropic gift that allowed us to do this so we can do now you know we can do a thousand units a week you know for those COVID devices we're not limited by wow. devices right now we're just limited by data like how do we process and handle all the data and figure out what's going on yeah. so so we have um, tools 
sort of small scale tools, but, but otherwise operating based on principles that are identical to those used in the largest sort of manufacturing houses. This is not at the IC fab level. This is at the flex printed, printed circuit board and packaging level that we have this capability. So, so we can um, do end to end now. So, so we have uh, devices that allow us to do uh, a flexible printed circuit board printing. We have screen printers. We have uh, high speed pick and place units. We have reflow wow. ovens. We have um, um, uh, debonding de uh, uh, tools, deframing de uh, systems, and and we have um, presses that allow us to do do packaging. So that's probably not going to be, you know, a kind of resource that's going to be more broadly available, but it's relatively recent set of capabilities that we've installed just because we ended up going to these outside manufacturing partners frequently enough that if you look at the economics it's just cheaper for us to own it <laughs> but but for other other groups you you can tap in to to the to the outsourced kind of manufacturing route if if you're interested uh, in in going in that direction it's mm -hmm. it's feasible you know there's a time delay and there's a cost it's not cheap but 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 you can uh you can do that so I, I don't know if that answers your question, but that that's kind of how uh, we're we're approaching it. And right. and we actually did did all this stuff before COVID because we we decided we need to be able to control. And you can also put yourself in a position where you can modify the manufacturing tools to allow new capabilities that wouldn't be possible if you're just transferable. Going you to mean the transferable, yeah. Yeah, Tra uh, yeah micro transfer printing and things like that. You can mm -hmm. modify these tools. So. I think it opens up some interesting kind of research opportunities in uh -huh. manufacturing science if you have these tools uh, in-house. And it was partly for that reason, partly because we're expanding in maternal and fetal, neonatal, pediatric rehabilitation. So so it just happened that, uh, it, that it was an amazing coincidence because uh, with COVID, you can't go to these manufacturing vendors anymore. They're all shut down. Uh -huh. And so the ability to do it in uh -huh. our labs is uniquely enabling. If we didn't have it, we, we couldn't do any of this stuff. I see. Okay. Thank we'll you. Thank Thanks a lot. Thank you. We'll go to Chen Jiang Yu, then we'll go to uh, Ni, uh, Nila Papa, Pala, uh, then we'll go to Zijian Yang, then Zhang Li. Okay, Chen Jiang. Thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Jimmy, for the uh, uh, giving me this opportunity. And also thank the EML team, uh, Professor Zigang, uh, Zigang So attendee, and of course, also uh, uh, John Rogers for, uh, you know, this really creating this opportunity. Especially uh, thank you, John, for uh, sharing the latest, the very exciting, impactful results uh, on the uh, COVID-19 uh, uh, monitoring system. I think it's extremely uh, exciting and inspiring. And also thanks uh, very much for uh, creating a flexible, stretchable and bioinical electronics. And uh, these days, you know, uh, probably under, uh, more, uh, under uh, estimation is more than thousands or even more people have been really, you know, working in this field, uh, a very broad and, uh, you know, a wide community nowadays. And I think, uh, John, you have been a uh, touch base on uh, how to work on a specific research topic. So for faculty or people from a different fields, but they also want to, you know, work on flexible, stretchable bioelectronics. So, what kind of uh, you know uh, suggestions you, you have for those people really want to choose a topic that be unique? Because you can look at these days, you know, all the <laughs> I think I only heard the first part of that, so I'll I'll throw out an answer, and if I if I don't really touch on on the key points of your question, then let me know, and we can try another round. So I think the question was like, if you're interested in this space, how do you go about selecting topics to 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 do to do research around, and uh, how do you get started? Maybe it's a question I don't know. Yeah, exactly. Say, uh, 
if you're a junior faculty member, um, you're kind of resource constrained in a, in a, in a sense. And, and I would uh, recommend against trying to build, build a full system and the software and all this kind of stuff. It's, it's going to lie outside of the scope of where you are kind of in your career uh, progression. I would instead um, look for um, certain topics, you know, underlying topics in mechanics or materials. We talked about adhesives, right? Anybody could do that. And I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity there. Or uh, the other question was coming uh, around, you know, mechanics of skin. You know, how do, how do you think about that? And how do you model it? It's a complex multi-layered system. It's time dynamic and you got flow. And like, how do you begin to, you know, think, think about putting a mechanics oriented framework about, you know, the, the skin, for example, might be another one. Or, you know, I think um, Young Gong and I, and, and this, this is a field that has some history as well, but, but we've been really looking at fundamental aspects of, uh, you know, fluid dynamics and pulse fluid flow through elastomeric pipes as a way to uh, try to infer blood pressure from measurements of pulse wave velocity. And yeah, that's a topic that, that um, you know, you have, you have to be talented, obviously. Young Gong's very talented, but like anybody could do that. There's not a, a huge experimental or, you know, capital cost associated with getting into that uh, field, right? And it's super important, you know, and, and if you if you can come up with some some really neat, neat ideas and, and contribute, then you can have huge impact without taking on manufacturing tools and so software engineers and all this crazy stuff, right? You don't have to do that. I think um, you've done a great job. I, I mean, I, I think you've been able to pick out some really interesting topics and develop some new materials and add to the broader toolbox of techniques and approaches and sensors would be another example. I think Nanshu has done a great job also of kind of balancing, you know, kind of constraints associated with being a assistant professor, but nevertheless pu publishing super interesting papers around, you know, fundamental mechanics of, uh, you know, how these serpentines uh, operate and how to op optimize that and putting a theoretical framework around it. So I think there's just a tremendous range of topics, right, that, um, that you can pick out, right, and, and, and study individually. And then you're contributing to a, to a broader community in a really powerful way without needing to develop and deploy systems. It's hard, you know, and it's expensive. It's like incredibly expensive. <laughs> so I would just be careful about going down that path. And that might be an initial instinct. Oh, I'm going to go and build a wireless XYZ and it's going to monitor this type of patient. Okay, you could do that, but it's going to be a slog. You need a giant group and you need all kinds of stuff. So I just be careful about it uh, and, and choose things that are academically interesting, scientifically rich, but but also with some kind of eye uh, around like what you're hoping to, to accomplish, you know, in, in terms of driving the technology. Because I think the the science component is fantastic, but if it's ultimately not connected to a technology that people care about, and I think this is going to be increasingly true as we move forward through this pandemic and trillions of dollars have you know, been, been spent on trying to revive economies, there's just going to be a huge, huge awareness around what's this stuff good for, you know, and how is it going to help human health and all this kind of stuff. That My guess is it's going to be inevitable. You know, Congress is allocating money for academic research and they're ultimately responsible to the taxpayer and they are not going to be able to just ignore it, you know. And so so I think the science, but in the context of, of something that could could be, uh, you know, impactful and, and, and choose problems kind of not rigidly tied to a set of requirements necessarily. Obviously, it's still academic research. You don't want to be overly, you know, constrained in, in what you're doing, but kind of an eye toward like how it would play out, right? If if you if you figure things out, you know, and and how it would intersect, you know, uh, societal needs. I think it's it's a good good way to think about problems. It's sort of that Bell Labsian kind of worldview that that I was talking to Jimmy about uh, er, earlier on. Okay, so, thank you uh, very much. Jigo, yeah, uh, Jigong reminded me that uh, I should uh, I should mention that people should feel free to uh, to leave, uh, but uh, John has uh, graciously agreed to uh, hang around for a little longer to answer some of the questions. Uh, and the next one is uh, Nilopala Kuma. Yes, uh, hello. Thank you so much, Jimmy. Um, thank you so much for uh, initiating the talk and uh, Professor Rogers 
your talk was really great, especially the work that's going on with COVID-19 patients right now. Uh, I had absolutely no idea that there was this spot near the throat which could be used which could be utilized, which is basically so rich for information. So my question is a bit uh, directed uh, uh, regarding the adhesives. So uh, for example, uh, if a sensor uh, that is, I mean, for example, an ECG sensor, which utilizes an electrode, um, the, and to, in order to allow the uh, skin conformability, adhesives are being used. So uh, does the adhesive also cover up the electrode? And if so, if it does that, wouldn't it lead to signal degradation or is the adhesive a conductive adhesive? It's typically conductive. So these are conductive uh, hydrogels. Ionic conductivity, you know, uh, is, is what we are doing typically. Although we and others have also published on uh, capacitively coupled sensors where that um, thin layer is a, is a dielectric. Uh, and then you can just measure through through capacitive coupling, similar types of uh, signals tend to be weaker though, and uh, hydrogels t tend to work work really well. I mean, they they have a tendency to dry out is is the is the main problem. But uh, yeah. you can also uh, just have a dry interface. Uh, you know that that works uh, as well. You don't need a super low impedance to to capture ECG. So we and others as well have uh, published on purely dry interfaces to the skin uh -huh. where these kind of um, metal filaments have enough open space that the tacky surface of the uh, elastomer support becomes essentially the adhesive that keeps the system pressed against the skin. And then the uh, wires themselves are narrow enough and flexible enough that they can follow the, the topography of the skin. I think I showed the SEM. So so in that case, there's really there's really no adhesive. It's just Van der Waals interactions between the elastomer and the surface of the skin, mm -hmm. and that can work. That can work as well. It, I mean, it kind of depends on what what you want to do. But for COVID, it's it's um, you know there are no electrodes, so so we can use essentially any kind of skin bandage type type material there. For the neonates, the chest unit does require the electrical interface, so that's where we're using a hydrogel. But but the PPG unit that's going on the foot or the hand. Uh, just transparency, uh, optical transparency yes. in the requirement. Right. Uh, yeah. yeah, I feel okay. bad to say. Thank you so much for the quick answer. Yeah. Uh, uh, yeah, thank you so much for the organizer for holding this fantastic webinar during this quarantine. I found it really enjoyable. And of course, thank you so much, John, for sharing the fantastic and uh, up new updated news about your research since we met in Philadelphia last year. I'm currently working in disease diagnosis and one of the recent publications that I have overcame the low sensitivity of clinical CT scan and staging cancers for better treatment. I believe a lot of attendees who joined this webinar is also working to really pushing the limitations of our current Medicare systems. But before we putting it into a bigger multi-center validation or commercializations to make it really impactful, one of the most difficulties I've actually running through is something more than just science and engineering, such as the resistance or rather the big momentum to, to, to change the current clinical diagnosis, or even the fear that the doctors may lose their authorities. I was wondering if you were willing to share your experience and some opinions on this you know, uh, transmission spirit. Yeah, that, that's um, an interesting point. Um, I guess one of the reasons why we started in terms of our uh, clinical collaborations with um, measurement modalities that physicians are already deeply familiar with and measurement types that are done routinely as part of a clinical standard of care in a hospital is to address exactly that point. You know, we, we want a new device platform, but measuring quantities that they already understand, you know? So, you know, they wanna understand cardiac activity. We want to, our goal is to provide them with ECG because that's what they do, PPG, you know, they, they understand that. We didn't wanna come up, we didn't wanna start with a novel metric, a novel device platform and a novel measurement. Uh, that, that would have been much, much more difficult. I, I think we would have, um, you know, faced a, a large amount of resistance if, if that's kind of the approach that, that we took. So we wanted to start with things that they know and understand and value and uh, begin there. But, but that's not the stopping point. And th that once you've done that, now you have a validated platform that's providing data streams that they can act upon. 
They can uh, make patient recommendations based on their, their insights around that data. But now you have a unique framework that you can begin to expand you know, out into measurement modalities that they're not familiar with. So coughing, for example, seems like a simple thing, but there's no quantification around coughing. You talk to a nurse, oh, the patient's coughing a little bit more today than they were yesterday. And the cough is a little bit wetter and it's more intense, it's longer duration, or it's happening more at night than it was. That's purely qual qualitative. So I guess the next level going beyond things they're already measuring is to patient characteristics that they understand are important, but they're not measuring right now. But now we have a way to quantify it. That's also pretty easy. So we're doing, doing cough counts. I ask them, how accurate does it need to be? They said, I don't know, we're not measuring it right now. If you could make a 60% accurate cough count, that would be great. You know? <laughs> and so we do that and then cough sounds, right? And then whether a swallow happens after a cough could, could mean something or we're getting body orientation. So when you're coughing, are you coughing like that? Or are you coughing like this? Or like what's going on? Are you coughing more when you're lying down or on your right side? Or I mean, all kinds of you know, additional insights can, can flow. And so you kind of build up uh, in, in that uh, in that sort of sort of direction uh, to be, to gradually kind of in, introduce things uh, over time. So it's not a radical shift suddenly. It's like adiabatically starting known, starting known but unquantified, and then kind of kind of move, moving in that direction is the way that we've we've been thinking about it. So an example in the NICU. So and it's it's related actually. The coughing is. The, the chest units that we're deploying in Africa in the Nature Medicine paper, that's doing ECG, but it's also now doing body sounds. So we have st digital stethoscope functionality built in. So we can measure vocal biomarkers associated with crying. So we can tell you when the baby's crying, what is the cadence and the tonality of the crying. And the nurses know crying is important, but like it's not being measured and you can't measure with a microphone you go into the NICU, like all the babies are crying simultaneously. It's totally impossible. But if you have a device on the chest, you're capturing just the crying dynamics of that individual. And then the question is like, what do you do with that information and how do you extract insights from it? So it's another example similar to cough is crying, right? It's really the only way for these patients to communicate. And, and can, can you interpret <laughs> what they're saying, right, is, is kind of a thing. So, so th I, I just think there's a like, lot, lot of really neat untapped opportunities once you have a foothold, and then you can add, add to it over time. So I don't know if that's addressing your question necessarily, but, but it might be one way to think about how to, how to introduce new, new, new technology. It does pretty precise, precisely. Thanks. Fascinating. Uh, so, Chang, you're next, and uh, after that, uh, Milad, uh, maybe we'll give you a chance to. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Uh, hi, Professor. Right. It's a really beautiful work and a beautiful talk. Thank you so much. So, uh, my research is mainly focused on the biology, so about the human proportion stem cell and organoid culture. So, I was wondering, can you talk a little bit more about your organoid project, like how to integrate this? By electronics in with the organos and how to record in the signals. So I think it's yeah. I, I apologize I that I wasn't able to get to that part of the talk. Like I said at the outset, you know, we ended up having a lot more COVID nineteen related content, and I I wanted to include that. Just assuming that a lot of people who are listening to the talk would be interested in that. So I I missed the content that may have <laughs> aligned most closely with your own interests. I I apologize, but. What we're doing there is, um, I, I guess you're, you're familiar with organoids and spheroids and assembloids and so on. And so the idea is you can take uh, stem cells from a, from a patient, you can differentiate them, let's say, into neurons and then grow them into a small sphere. So it becomes kind of a, I don't know, mini brain is a term that the community doesn't like to use, but for outsiders, I think it's a good way to think about it. It's just small spheres, maybe 500 microns to one millimeter in diameter. And it's functioning neurons, and they're communicating, and they have a, a neural network uh, established. And uh, the, the question is whether you could use those um, organoids as the basis for studying the response of a patient to a drug or for studying processes of neuroregeneration that are patient-specific because they're genetically the same as, as the patient, having been derived from stem cells. And you know all of that. So, so the, the question is, like, how do you probe those spheres? So 
traditionally people use two-dimensional multi-electrode arrays and you can study planar cell cultures that way pretty, pretty effectively. But if you think about this three-dimensional object as a sphere sitting on a plane, you can only really capture electrical activity in that very small bottom surface. You miss what's going on all around the outside surface of the, of the sphere. So that's one thing. The other thing is there are efforts to take multiple organoids, let's say a cortical organoid with a cardiac organoid and, and, and begin to sort of plug them together in, into what's known as assembloids. And then they form interconnected uh, structures that, that are fascinating from a basic um, research standpoint. And a uh, related question then is not only how do you interface with these 3D objects, but how do you deterministically assemble them together? And they're little balls of like, snot basic. I mean, they're like incredibly fragile. You can't like take tweezers and like pick them up as you probably know, because they're very soft. So you need some kind of 3D super compliant kind of framework to hold them and to deliver sort of measurement functionality or stimulation functionality around the outside. And that's kind of what we've been working on over the last couple of years. So we have ways to take these 2D structures and by using mechanical buckling techniques, we can move them up into the third dimension. And in fact, we can create like little pockets, like little uh, spherical frameworks matched in geometry to these uh, organoids. We can just drop them in and we can embed all kinds of electronic functionality, LEDs, electrodes, uh, temperature sensors, thermal actuators, strain gauges into those frameworks and they're interfaced all around the outside. And we can watch how neural networks form. We can build frameworks that are much more complex than just a simple pouch pocket to uh, you know, collections of such pockets that allow us to position multiple organoids relative to one another. So we can create sort of tri-organoid assembloids and connect them. We can take two cortical uh, organoids, we put them in a framework designed for this purpose, they come together and then over time they merge, they grow across that gra gap. You end up with these neurite bridges. And then you can come in and you can watch um, electrical activity and watch as that bridge forms, they, they begin to uh, develop synchronous firing. So the activity of this organoid mini brain gets correlated to the other one because now they've grown together. Then you can come in with a, um, a lancet and basically cut it. You cut them in half and then you can watch the bridge reform in terms not only of the microscopy, you can see the cells going across the bridge, but you can also watch the time dependence of the reestablishment of that synchrony. So you can study aspects of regenerative medicine that are relevant to spinal cord injuries, for example, or traumatic brain injuries. And we're doing all of those kinds of uh, studies with experts in uh, neuroscience at the uh, rehabilitation clinic uh, downtown. So I, I don't know, I mean, I, I, I'd be happy to send you my slides uh, separately. It's all unpublished work. We just submitted uh, uh, our first paper uh, on this, but th that's kind of what we're doing and using mechanical engineering concepts to form these 3D frameworks and then leveraging those unique capabilities in the context of these 3D uh, tissue constructs. Okay, thank you, it's fantastic. I know Jirgang has a question. Uh, Mila, do you want to ask your question first? Sorry, we cannot hear you. Still not cannot hear you. Uh, we, we still cannot hear you. Okay. okay. Uh, Jugang, why don't you? Uh, Jugang, maybe you, you can answer your question first. Hey, John. Yeah. Fantastic. Your... Always learn things from you. Yeah, unbelievable. Now, um, uh, so you mentioned that the, uh, the biophysical sensors in recent years have uh, undergone tremendous development. And you, what you want are biochemical sensors. Now, but of course there is a traditional uh, field, substantial field using semiconductor to sense uh, signals, as long as the signal has any electrical characteristic. H how do you think about these things? Yeah, so you can use a transistor in that way. So it's a great question. So. If you have a um, pair of source and drain electrodes, you have a semiconductor channel and you adsorb some enzyme or some uh, electrolyte that electrically biases the channel, you measure a change in conductivity. It's a great basis for a sensor. The problem is in specificity. 
uh, and stability, uh, those two things. So, so how do you generate a sensor of that type that's only responding to a certain molecule in a bath of a very complex mixture of all kinds of other molecules that you don't want to sense? So I think that's where aptamers come in. I think I'd mentioned that before. So <clears throat> it's been some nice work at UCLA showing um, how you can use DNA frameworks and you use kind of uh, directed evolution to find certain base sequences that bind selectively to a target species like dopamine, if you're interested in uh, measuring neurotransmitter or serotonin. And if you tether those aptamers to the surface of a field effect transistor, then that binding event um, translates into an electrical field that modulates the conductance. And I think that's what you're referring to. So I, I would say that strikes me as a, a generalizable approach. Uh, everything else is kind of ad hoc. You're trying to find a, uh, you know, an antibody or an antigen or an enzyme or a, you know, a specific molecule, but, but there you're, the, the complexity is such that it's hard to just build them using synthetic chemical approaches from the ground up because it's too, too, too difficult to model what the molecule needs to look like to serve as a selective binding site for, for an analyte species. But, but I think with uh, directed evolution and with uh, DNA type approaches, it becomes a little bit more, like I said, generalizable. Uh, but it's still very early days because even if you can develop the aptamer, and even now that's a very, very difficult uh, process, uh, only a very small number of labs uh, have the ability to do that. And only a small number of examples have been shown uh, you know, to, to be successful using that scheme. But, but even if you can get it to work, you put one of those kinds of sensors in the body and immediately it's biofouled. You know, it's like two days later, it's coated with a biofilm, you know, all kinds of excretions from adjacent cells. And now your sensing surface is electrically isolated from the surrounding, you know, bi biofluids where, where you want to do the sensing. So, so yeah, I guess maybe your broader point is, isn't a biochemical sensor really just a an adapted biophysical sensor? And I guess in, in a way it is, but but it's it's the chemistry piece that, that represents the uh, miss, missing component of the puzzle, I guess. Can I ask a, a follow-up question related? Um, this talk, uh, you focus on skin-attached sensors. Over the years, you and many others try to develop uh, implanted sensors. Can you say a little bit about implanted sensors? Yeah, we still do, do a lot of work in that space, so probably a third of the group is, is focused on implantables. And I think, um, you know, we kind of have two streams of work in that realm. One is in the development of uh, advanced implantable tools for neuroscience research on animals. So really the target is animals and that, that's it. We're just, just doing, doing that. And, uh, you know, we've, we've done, uh, you know, a lot in the area of optogenetics and implantable systems for studying various processes of the brain, pain responses, interfaces to the peripheral nervous system, spinal cord, bladder control, kidney, uh, kidney uh, monitoring as well in the context of uh, transplants and rejection. So, so there's a fair amount of work. And I would say we're pretty happy with where we are you know, in, in that realm because we have tools and, and systems and we've stood up a small company and we've you know, made, made those technologies available to the broader community. And that's worked out uh, really well. I mean, we're not making money, but at least get, getting it out into the hands of people who can, who can use that. I mean, it's just kind of a sustainable thing. But um, I guess the other direction is really with an eye toward use you know, in, in humans. And um, it's just really difficult because um, you know, the kinds of um, you know, approval oversight and, and the regulatory pathways associated with an implantable is just in a whole different realm compared to a skin interface device. When you have an implantable, you can't just peel it off if it's not working. <laughs> so it's, uh, I think it's probably a, a, a longer term effort for us. We're, we're deeply interested in it. But we like skin because we can get things in the hospital like quickly and uh, and and make an impact on healthcare in the near term. And and I think that's that's an important part of what we're hope, hoping to do. But but the, the Im implants are very interesting. It's it's also much more challenging. And and I would say it's still kind of amazing how difficult it is. So so you can build these devices. You can do full modeling. You know. The, the limits of strain where you begin to get plastic deformation, you can study the water penetration properties of the encapsulant, you can do all kinds of things on the bench top, you have 
sort of cycling tests. You can bend them and twist them, thousands and thousands of cycles. Looks great. You put them in an animal, device is dead in a day. You know, I mean, there's something that's just profoundly hard about like how a, an animal's body is moving around and the forces that are being parted on the devices by the muscles and the bones and the and the flow of, of, of chemistry. It's it's very difficult. And and we have some examples of things that work, but again, you know, in terms of getting things into humans, it's it's tough, you know, and and, and I think it's a great, you know, research direction, but we're not expecting you know, to launch an implantable, you know, kind of commercial product any, anytime soon. I think ultimately you would have to team with a large company that has deep, longstanding expertise and, uh, and, a, and, a, and a history of, uh, you know, uh, grappling with those type of problems. Thank you. Okay. I'll give uh, Mila another chance. Then after right. that, uh, Ling Wu, you, I think you are, you unmuted yourself. Then after that, Dong Sheng Xu. Okay, Mila. Yeah, I hope you hear me now. Yes, yeah. I can. Okay, thank you so much for your interesting presentation, Professor Rogers, and also for initiating this uh, fantastic webinar here. Um, I'm a PhD student, and actually I'm from Germany now, uh, so very glad to be here with you. Uh, I'm mostly from the signal processing part and modeling of the signals. I, uh, I, when I usually see your works, uh, I see, for example, people are using these smart watches uh, to read the uh, signals, uh, heart signal when they are doing sports. But uh, when I see the uh, research there and we are talking about ICU and uh, other, this kind of uh, uh, unique cares. Uh, so I think the, validation accuracy of the classification of these signals can be very challenging. And I saw in your presentation, you, you showed uh, some result in that case. So how promising is this? And how, uh, like, uh, how accurate is this classification? This is my first question. And I have uh, another question, short question about the reader part. Like, um, uh, as I know, uh, you're, you, you're using the bed to read out uh, as the read, uh, read out system for the um, NFC part for the babies. And you're using the ultra high frequencies there. So uh, this means uh, there should be some research on the effect of ultra high frequency devices on babies and uh, especially in the ICU and uh, intensive cares. So uh, the last question uh, is, how is this cost effective at the end? Um, I want to have uh, more comments in these areas. Yeah, so it's, it's data, it's RF, and <laughs> it's, um... I guess data plus our uh, uh, accuracy RF and what, what was the, the last one impact or um, cost 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 okay cost. yeah so so for, first of all um, RF it's it's not UHF it's just HF so so we're operating at thirteen point five six megahertz there's very little to no I guess negligible uh, absorption uh, associated with water or biological tissues in that frequency range it's the same frequency band used for RFID tags. They, they use it in the hospital pretty frequently. They even use it to, um, sometimes they tag surgical sponges. Uh, there's a commercial product that's sold and uh, FDA approved um, so that uh, the doctors can scan the patient at the end of the surgery, make sure they haven't left any sponges behind. Uh, they pull them out, you know, so it's, it's a frequency range the hospitals are fairly uh, familiar with and, and comfortable with. So I don't know of any um, health concerns or around that. I would say though that uh, you know, when we got in with Gates and Save the Children and we think about Africa, it wasn't viable to, to use uh, you know, NFC power transfer and, and read out um, because they don't have a stable source of electricity, sometimes no electricity at all. And, and so you can't plug your antenna into the wall and expect it to operate reliably. They have blackouts on a daily basis. So 
So it wasn't an option. So we had to move to very small rechargeable battery. So, so that, that NFC piece kind of went away. We still have it as an option, you know, and I, and I think it was, it was, uh, you know, a great engineering exercise to kind of put that together and, uh, and, and make it, make it operate, you know, in, in a realistic way on, on real patients and so on. But, but for the scale deployments, it's it's not not being used. Uh, you know, the the platform again that's being used is the one in nature medicine, not uh, science. Uh, we could have done the science, but there were some considerations of fragility. You need to be able to reuse and reuse, and you can't, you know, uh, assume you have a stable uh, uh, source of uh, wall plug uh, power. So, so that's that. The the cost. Um, Again, we had to go through uh, a detailed cost breakdown. I had a chance to meet Bill Gates and he got interested. I mean, he's moving beyond vaccines into data and sensing. And, and so we're, we're part of that. And uh, you have to go through with the Gates folks a, a cost stack up because they're not gonna fund something that's not viable from, from an economic standpoint. So if you go through it and you, and you think about the, the lifetime of the sensors and the, the consumables and stuff like that, it ends up, uh, you know, a couple cents per patient per day, roughly amortized out kind of over the life of the, uh, of the device is, is one way to think about it. But, it. but it depends very, very heavily on scale, you know, ma manufacturing volumes um, and, and many other things, but, but you can get into a very low cost uh, regime, you know, if, if you're doing reusable, rechargeable uh, uh, devices and you're just using the cell phone for the monitor, you know, and, that, and that's fine. <laughs> and that's fine. So, so that's that. The um, uh, the data piece. So, um, I guess we're we're finding that that data analytics and machine learning and uh, neural networks and uh, all this kind of stuff is um, very much a growing important uh, component of what we're doing. And so. We have collaborators that we, we tap into. We work with folks back at UIUC. We have collaborators at CMU and Johns Hopkins that we're working with on the data. It's not our core expertise, but I don't see how we avoid it. It's almost like the software interface. If you don't have competency in that, then it's very difficult to, to, to move forward uh, aggressively. So, uh, you know, a number of students in, in the group have uh, gotten interested in that space. And I think like machine learning, um, you, know, you can go to the computer science guys, but but they're, for the most part, my experience is they're not interested in real data. They're interested in next generation algorithms and so on. And so I think machine learning as it applies to medical data is going to be driven by the medical and engineering experts, not the computer science guys, not the machine learning experts. You know, it's going to be driven by the practitioners who understand the data and what features are meaningful and what features are not. And Maybe that's where you sit. I, I'm not sure, but but I think that's that's the community that's really going to drive it. And so, in that sense, I think maybe we're in a good position. A lot of these learning techniques are pretty much canned routines at this point. You you can't use them strictly as a black box, but they're widely accessible. And so, we're doing the best we can. I think with the with the cough, we we uh, wanted to just start with a more deterministic digital filtering frequency filtering approach. And uh, looking at time series and, and spectrograms and kind of classifying based on insights and and uh, and, and data collected, uh, you know, in, in a labeled fashion, and that seems pretty good. But I think if, if the next stage would be to try to tease out additional information beyond cough count and cough intensity to some of these other characteristics we were uh, discussing earlier, and and there I think machine learning is going to be essential. And we we have collaborators we're working on kind of in the, in that realm. But in terms of accuracy, um, I think if you're in the ICU, you have gold standard continuous data streams. And we just do one-to-one -one comparison. You determine it right away. And you get bland Altman plots with millions of data points and you can quantify everything. It's very straightforward. It's a little bit tougher if you're monitoring a COVID patient at home because like, you know, what was his heart rate at any given time? You don't, you don't really have a separate measure, measurement of that. Uh, and also, you don't know whether a cough was really a cough or something else. So, so there, you you have to um, do the best you can, I guess. I mean, o over time, I think that you would be able to do scaled studies and validation, you know, in in home settings and so on. Maybe that's what you're getting to. But at the same time, like I I've worn these devices myself, so I was wearing one all weekend, and uh, my students were then analyzing the data, which was a little freaky actually because i was wondering what kind of signatures they're pulling out of my data they figure out what i'm doing at home and stuff but <laughs> but anyway they, they got my heart rate and uh, 
it was for the most part smooth and you could see the circadian rhythms and all that stuff. And occasionally you see like a spike in heart rate. I ask them what, what's going on? Like, is that, that's gotta be noise or whatever. And then they pulled up the time series data corresponding to that spike and crystal clear. You could see the, uh, the lub dub, you know, the cardiac sounds pick, picking up in the, in the, uh, in the uh, data, the raw, raw data. So it's absolutely, there's no way that that could be inaccurate, right? The timing uh, accuracy is there. The, the features are, are crystal clear in terms of signal of the noise. There was just an anomalous event. It would turn out like it was at night. I got up and when you get up from bed, immediately after that, you can get a spike in your heart rate. It can almost double. It's amazing. Like I was at a base rate of 45 beats per minute and then for about 20 seconds after I got up, you could see a very crisp signature of uh, cardi cardiac activity. And my heart rate during that time was almost 80. And so in some sense, you don't even need validation. There's no need to validate. You're looking at the data. It's right there. There's no, no way that could be wrong, right, in, in, in a sense. And so, so in certain instances, I, I think validation is very important. But, but at, at some level, like the data is the data. There, there's no, I mean, it's digital data stream and, and it's, uh, you know, precise uh, timing accuracy. So that might be one additional way that, that you can think about, you know, accuracy for, for certain specific uh, signals like, like, like cardiac activity. Thank you so, so much. Ning Wu, then Dong Sheng Xu, then I think Wei Hua, you had you wanted to ask a question. So let's do this sequence. Oh, hey, uh, thank you very much for giving me the opportunity, Dr. Uh, Professor Rogers. Very, very uh, fortunate to uh, hear your lecture today. I actually have been exposed to your research from a kind of a strange angle uh, before. Uh, I happen to be a good friend of a Professor Huang, and we actually were. Uh, college classmates back in 1980s. Oh. <laughs> and so I've heard about your uh, stretchable electro uh, electronics uh, at dinner table and the cocktails and many, many times. Uh, I happen to be a practicing physician in the Chicago suburb. And oh. so I listened today uh, as a way of enlightening me myself. And uh, I really enjoyed the, your talk. A couple questions. Uh, first of all, specifically the device that you have done for the COVID patient, I missed that part. Was, were you able to also measure uh, oxygen saturation? No, not in that device. I mean, that, that is something of interest. We, we didn't have that kind of ready to go. And the request from the Ability Lab was just on cough and temperature. And, and we felt like we could do that. And that's where we get started. But it, it would be easy to add SpO2. And we have another module um, that, that we could deploy. Um, we, we could do do that, and, and we do have that in mind as kind of a second phase. It, would, you know, it, it sounds like from clinical perspective, all these uh, uh, severe cases, so they're triggering clinical yeah. sign is a drop of a, uh, oxygen saturation. Yeah. Yeah. And I'll, I'm, I'm asking a lot of these questions totally as an outsider, because I have really very little knowledge of what you guys do, but it's just very fascinating. But one of the things I was thinking about as I was listening to this, is what is the application on brain activity? And are you able to pull uh, brain activity? You know, the, the, the book that I read by Yuval uh, Harari in the uh, book Homo Deus de described the scenario that in the future, the brain activity can be downloaded and then also knowledge can be uploaded into brain. What do you think of that? And how far away uh, are we from there from technical perspective? Yeah, I, I don't know. Maybe getting a little bit outside of my depth, that's the kind of a real kind of hard hardcore neuroscience question. I mean, there's a technology component, obviously, as well. I mean, I, I would start by saying in terms of uh, like near-term opportunities, we're doing multi-lead and uh, amplitude EEG measurements on neonates. That, that's something that is of interest to the, to the folks down, downtown at, at Lurie. So, so we can do that. It's all wireless and stuff. And uh, so we were just about to launch into uh, a first phase of clinical studies using that device when the COVID thing hit. So, so that, that's something that's in that realm of brain monitoring. It's not the sci-fi you know, vision that, that you're uh, describing, which I think is very interesting. I mean, maybe it's not fiction in, in a sense, but, but that, that's kind of more, more realistic, immediate you know, opportunity that we're uh, pursuing. Um, but in terms of um, programming um, memories into the brain, there, there's really fascinating work um, uh, in, in a community, sub-community within the neuroscience um, 
field called optogenetics, and uh, it allows you to um, optically excite or inhibit specific uh, cell types, specific neurons uh, in, in the brain. And um, there was a paper out of Stanford and Columbia, one in cell and one in nature, maybe six months ago, where they were using optogenetic approaches to write memories uh, into into uh, rat brains, you know, so it can happen and, and it, it is gonna happen. I, I think it's quite possible. And, um, you know, these optogenetic approaches are so powerful. They, they use uh, viral vectors to uh, introduce DNA into specific types of neurons that lead to the expression of a um, photo photoactivatable channel, channel rhodopsin in, in the membranes of these uh, neurons. And so with light, you can really turn things on and off in, in a way that offers uh, you know, a precision that goes far beyond anything that's possible with electrical stimulation. And uh, you, know, you might want to pull those papers up. One, one was uh, from Carl Deseroff's group, uh, and the other was uh, Rafe Yuste uh, at Stanford and uh, Columbia, respectively. And they're basically reporting the same thing. So it's a great kind of uh, validation, right, that, that, that it's real. And, and it's, a, it's amazing what, what they're able to do. So it's basically spatially programming a pattern of light to reproduce um, a memory that, that was developed by training the, the animal. And, and you could erase the memory, and then you could rewrite it. And it, it's pr pretty amazing. The um, human translation, though, is um, uncertain. My guess is it will eventually happen. But you can imagine because optogenetics requires a, a, a genetic modification to, to the brain, that there's gonna be a regulatory hurdle there in order to get it uh, approved for use in humans. <laughs> so uh, probably it'll happen at some point, uh, but uh, that, that will probably be the physical realization. And then there's a whole like engineering opportunity of how I do implantable light sources and control them and power them and allow them to wirelessly communicate. And that's kind of where we come in. But the, but the base biology is develop, being developed by, by others and, and re really creative, amazing people uh, are doing that work. And then we're kind of supporting that with, with technology and maybe creating new opportunities where we can with new materials or new, new devices. Well, thank so you so we'll much. I really appreciate it. Thank you so much. Okay, we'll take the two more questions. That would be the last two questions we take. Dongsheng, Xu, then Reihua. Okay, uh, this is from China. I'm not sure the signal can go there, go your place uh, well. Uh, first, I would like to thank uh, Zhigang to let me know this uh, seminar. And then thanks John and Jimmy for this uh, excellent lecture. I learned a lot because I'm an outsider. So uh, maybe my question is too stupid. So uh, uh, please allow me to do it. Uh, first question is that, uh, I see a lot of uh, uh, sensors related with skin. Uh, some of them are very small. Uh, I'm wondering how small these sensors can be, can be made into, so that, uh, for example, to detect the movement or even the stress uh, on a blood vessel. So to see how the blood vessel uh, responds with the heartbeat and uh, if the frequency of the signal uh, quick enough to uh, relate it with this detected signal with the heartbeat. Uh, this is uh, my first question. Uh, the other is uh, uh, related with COVID-19, maybe not related with this uh, uh, talk. Uh, it's regarding the transmission between the uh, person uh, that is the transmission through the air. They say uh, the uh, aerosol uh, transmission. Uh, I'm wondering, this is uh, maybe the uh, worst uh, uh, transmission we can prevent because touch, direct touch or others we know well so that easily prevent it. Uh, maybe that is uh, something I'm eagerly to know because I just recently got a adjunct position from the China Medical School to collaborate with them for some medical student. So uh, could you uh, give some information or comments on that? Yeah, so um, one is size miniaturization and the other is detection of airborne viral particles, I guess. So 
So for size miniaturization, I would split it into two parts. One um, would be around the sensors themselves and the supporting electronics. What, what are the challenges in size miniature, miniaturization there? And then the other is the communication channel, like how do you get information in and out? And um, for the first part of the um, challenge, I think it's already solved. You know, in, in most cases, the sensors can min be miniaturized, no problem. Like if you just need a point measurement, you, you can make that measurement a very, very tiny uh, area. You know, if you're measuring pressure, temperature, flow, you can scale it down, you know, however small you want it, down, down to individual size of a cell. It's not a problem, e even below that. If you think about, you know, the industry I'd mentioned before, you know, they're moving to three nanometer gate lengths, two nanometers is on the horizon. So you can pack a lot of computational capability in very, very small areas. And, and that's, that's happening anyway, right? Due, due to other application drivers. The bigger problem is uh, how do you communicate with it? <laughs> and so, um, a lot of what we do is around uh, RF. We're talking about uh, high frequency RF, that's 13.56 megahertz. And uh, you can get coupling into an antenna with a diameter of maybe eight millimeters, much smaller than that. The efficiency drops off very, very strongly and, and it gets hard uh, to do things that way. So other groups, and, and we're fine because we, we haven't needed, needed to scale below that. So we've kind of stayed with uh, the near field uh, approaches, but but there are groups. Uh, one one at uh, Cornell, Paul McEwen's group, and one at uh, Berkeley, Michelle Maharbi's. They're they're looking at uh, optical uh, approaches and ultrasonic. So so optical, the wavelengths are much shorter, so so it scales nicely. Um, you can uh, deliver power optically, and then uh, you can communicate back out optically as well, you know, with a, with a photodiode and, and a uh, light emitting diode, uh, for example. Uh, there are some practical problems with that, like, you know, the amount of power you need to do anything useful, you know, requires pretty intense illumination. And usually that's coming from a laser. So you have to keep it aligned with the device. And there's just some kind of practical considerations. I think it's interesting. The uh, ultrasonic approach is similar, but instead of photo detectors, you're using piezoelectrics. And instead of uh, light emitting diodes, you're just looking at backscattered uh, ultrasound and, and, and you're imprinting data streams onto that backscattered waveform. Uh, and that works, you know, and, and you know, ultrasonic imaging is pretty widespread. And so there's plenty of you know, capabilities and the transducers that go onto the skin, but then you have to wear something on the skin and you also have to focus the ultrasound and sort of track it and so that it can follow the device and uh, as you're moving around. So, so there's some limitations, but I think um, si size scaling is, uh, is, is, is a really interesting topic. We, we have a program with Edwards Life Sciences where we're doing, uh, you mentioned blood vessels, we're doing uh, f uh, pressure and flow sensors in um, the pulmonary artery. And then we have a uh, battery-free wireless system, very similar to the one that we developed for the, the neonatal uh, monitoring, but, but adapted for that application. You do need uh, a proximity antenna on the chest in order to do the power delivery and communication, but, but that works. It's not tremendously miniaturized, but you mentioned blood vessels and flow monitoring and measuring. So, so we're doing that and that, that's fine. Um, and, and maybe you could extend those ideas to uh, min miniaturization. Uh, along the lines of what you're suggesting might require some different engineering approaches. Um, in terms of the um, airborne viral uh, propagation, I'm not sure that we're doing anything that would be relevant to that because um, I think the the amount of virus is very, very tiny. I mean, um, I don't know, I don't know <laughs> how you do it. Maybe somebody could come out of an answer to that, obviously be very powerful. I'm not I'm not sure. You know, it's a, it's an inter definitely a compelling, interesting topic. I'm not sure what what to suggest exactly. I mean, some some kind of collection vehicle. Typically, if you're doing gas based uh, sensing, we look at uh, volatile volatile organic compounds that build up in uh, uh, the the canopies of aircraft in, in in a project with the Air Force, and and there. For sensing of that type, you need a concentrator unit. So you need something that's pulling air into a filter element that's trapping the analyte so you can concentrate it to a level that's uh, detectable. And that's a lot of kind of mechanical engineering and fans and components and motors and things like that. We, we haven't worked on that aspect of it. We're teamed in a collaborative effort, but probably something like that would be required, right? To do pre-concentration 
uh, viral viral particles uh, in, in order to to allow sensing along the lines of what you're suggesting. But other than that, I'm not sure that I have any great great insights. Okay, Thank you very much. Far, you have the last question. Okay. Can everyone hear me? Okay, thank you. Hi, John. Thanks for your excellent speech, uh, report, and thanks for the organizer. My, uh, I'm I'm Rihua from China, a PhD can candidate who is doing some project of microfabrication of 2D material. So, my question is, in your opinion, uh, can 2D materials like graphene or moly play a unique role in this area? A great question. Probably in sensing. I, I think that would be the area of greatest opportunity uh, because of their 2D nature. Their you know, uh, electrical properties are modulated very strongly by, by interaction with their surroundings. So if you think about these kind of aptamer approaches or other ways to generate specificity and binding events and you couple that with a 2d material could could be very interesting you know as as a sensor a uh, chemical sensor specifically but as a replacement for silicon as a semiconductor component of a uh, circuit level piece of a system or radio or something like that it's a little bit less clear to me how, how it would necessarily compete I, I think it would be better positioned as as, as a sensing element so John, uh, it's been almost three hours. I didn't even see you have a sip of coffee uh, <laughs> during that time. <laughs> uh, do you have a, a few last words you want to say? Um, I don't know, maybe for the young people, you're trying to decide where to take your career and um, how to choose problems. And you're thinking about what to work on. I mean, the advice uh, George gave gave me when, when I was a student uh, postdoc kind of coming up was was good in the sense that um, you want to really choose problems that matter. You know, sci scientific questions whose answers could have impact, you know, and, and are addressing real problems and uh, societal challenges. And I think especially in, in this time, you know, things that intersect human health, you know, and, and, and help society at that level. I, I think you know, th those areas are, are worth considering very, very deeply if, if you're in the process of, of choosing a direction for your uh, career. Uh, the way George uh, framed it was, um, you know, you choose a science, science problem or, or a scientific area of research and you're asking questions and you, you need to consider, um, you know, the, the question, if, if the science works out better than you could possibly imagine, and all of the research is spectacularly you know, executed and, and you get to this end point, like who cares? If you can't answer the question, who cares, then maybe you should work on something different. <laughs> so that's may, maybe a perspective. And, and um, I think because it's academic research, it doesn't need to be overly constrained with engineering requirements and specific kind of device specifications, it can be a little bit diffuse, you know, in, in, in terms of that answer uh, uh, of the question, who cares, but but you should have a sense of where it would go, you know, if, if you figured it out, you know, wh whatever scientific question you're, you're working on. And uh, I think it's really important for, for society that the smartest, most energetic people are, are engaged in, in that kind of work, you know, and so I would encourage you to think about it in that way. Wonderful, wonderful. Thank you so much. Zhigang, you want to make a few comments? Um, no, thank you, John. Uh, and we, uh, this, uh, of course, uh, the meeting will start, webinar will start um, next week. Again, same time. Hua Gao will be the speaker. Okay, John, fascinating talk, wonderful talk. Uh, uh, I, actually, I've, uh, I've been watching the uh, uh, you know, the chat room, the question and answer. Many people mentioned that uh, this is truly enjoyable. Thank you so much for doing this. And, uh, uh, you know, uh, well, uh, of course, uh, I think many people benefited tremendously from this, but just to show you how dedicated some of these people are, the last two people who asked questions, it's 
45 minutes after midnight their time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Okay. Thank you Merci. very much. All right. Yeah. Thanks, Jimmy. Thanks, Thank you. Bye-bye. Yeah. Bye-bye. Thank you, John. Bye. Bye.